This happened to me in 2010. I'd moved up to Alaska after my wife passed. Figured the solitude would suit me. Got me a cabin outside of Anchorage, deep in the Chugash Mountains. Name's Harlan, Harlan Scott, if you really care. Start was good. Fishing, long hikes, that kind of peace you only find when the nearest neighbor is miles away. But Alaska's got its own kind of quiet. Not peaceful, but like, waiting. It seeps into you, makes the hair on your neck prickle. It started with my dog, Samson. Big shepherd, brave as they come. One night, he just refused to go out, not even for food. Started whining, cowered near the back door. Figured he picked up a scent of a bear or something. Happens. But it became a nightly battle. Never seen him act that way. Then the tracks found them behind the woodshed. Big, misshapen. No animal I recognized. Put it down to maybe a mutated moose. Tried to tell myself I was getting spooked over nothing. The dreams came next. Not nightmares, exactly. Just being watched, feeling a cold, hungry presence right at the edge of my vision. Woke up sweating, the silence of the cabin suddenly feeling heavy, oppressive. One early morning, maybe a week later... Samson let out a bark and bolted into the woods. Figured he finally caught wind of that damn moose. Didn't find hide nor hair of him all day. At dusk, heard a howl cut through the air, long, mournful, nothing like a wolf. My blood ran cold, because under that howl I heard a whimper, like a dog in pain. Never saw Samson again. Next morning, I went out armed. It was more than finding my dog, it was about ending whatever killed him. Figured that thing wouldn't be too far, full from its feast. Followed the tracks deep into a ravine. Lost them at a stream, like whatever made them just stepped into the water and vanished. Spent the better part of the day scouring that ravine, rifle at the ready. Nothing. Then, walking back, movement caught my eye. On the edge of the tree lean, there it was. Bigger than I thought, hunched over with grayish, mangy fur. Humanoid, in a way that made my skin crawl. Head was long, snout stretched out, and those eyes, yellow, like dying embers. Took a shot, not sure if I hit it or if it ducked into the trees. Figured cornering it was a fool's errand. Thing knew the terrain was probably toying with me. Hightailed it back to the cabin. That night, the silence wasn't just quiet, it throbbed. I boarded up windows, checked every latch, loaded the shotgun with buckshot. Tried to tell myself it was my nerves, that I was a grown man scared of shadows. The noise woke me. A scraping, tapping sound, like claws on the roof. My heart pounded in my ears. It circled the cabin, the tapping shifting from the roof to the windows, interspersed with a rasping growl that chilled me to the bone. Then, a single gunshot rang out. Silence. Didn't dare hope, but I waited until dawn. Crept outside, and there, sprawled at the foot of a tree, was the creature. Dead. Bullet wound straight between its eyes. Never saw hide nor hair of whoever saved my bacon that night. But let me tell you, I didn't stick around to play host. Packed up what I could carry, drove to the nearest town, and sold the cabin for a pittance. Reckon folks think I'm crazy. Maybe I am. Maybe I imagine the whole damn thing, grief for my lost dog warping my mind. But when I get that prickle on the back of my neck, when I see those damn yellow eyes and every flicker of shadow, I know it ain't so simple. The sheriff up there found some weird reports over the years. Missing hunters, livestock torn apart in ways that don't fit any predator they know. Nobody makes the connection, not in a place with bears and wolverines. But I know better. 
Heard a story the other day, a hiker gone missing round Denali. That's a ways from the Chugash, but a chill went down my spine all the same. Figure those things move on when the pickings get slim. I keep the shotgun loaded by the door. Mostly, it makes me feel safe. But some nights, I look out at the darkness pressing from the tree line, and I feel that old, primal fear creep up again. A fear that whispers, they ain't done. That thing in the ravine, it wasn't alone. And maybe, just maybe, it's got its hungry eyes on a new hunting ground. This happened to me in the spring of 1995. I was living alone up in Alaska then, in a little cabin outside of Nome. Figured if a man can't find solitude out there, then he ain't gonna find it nowhere. I'm woke, by the way. Back then, I worked odd jobs in town when I needed to, fishing, construction, bit of everything. Cabin life suited me. The breakup out on the Bering Sea had already started when it happened. Normally, that time of year I wouldn't venture too far out on the ice. Chunks drift away, a storm blows in, too easy to get cut off. But I'd spotted a group of seals sunning themselves on a distant flow a few days earlier, and figured on some fresh meat to make a stew. The day I went out was bright, clear, wind just a whisper. I was nearly a mile out before I saw the bear, a big old male. Must have drifted down on an ice floe just like I had, looking for an easy meal. Problem was, we were both headed towards the seals. I considered turning back, but stubbornness got the better of me. By the time I got in range of the seals, the bear was close, too. I managed to take one down with a clean shot before the rest scattered. Gutted the seal quick, tossed the carcass on my sled, figured I'd cut my losses. Then I saw them, the bear's tracks in the snow, and they weren't alone. It had a cub with it. That changed things. Mama bears are mean even when they ain't hungry. Hungry and with a cub to protect? That's a whole different kind of dangerous. Now I knew why it was still on the ice this late in the season. I started trekking back towards land, dragging the sled behind me. The wind had picked up, blowing snow that stung my face. And all the while, I could feel those bears gaining on me. I was about halfway back when I heard the crunch of ice breaking. Glanced over my shoulder, and saw a big chunk of the flow had separated leaving me and the bears stranded on a shrinking island of ice. There was maybe thirty yards of water between me and solid ground, growing wider all the time. The bears stopped on the far side. The mama bear reared up, sniffing the air, that big head swinging from side to side like it was trying to pinpoint me through the swirling snow. I knew it was just a matter of time before they decided to swim. I scanned the shrinking ice flow, getting desperate. That's when I saw it a long, jagged strip of ice jetting out towards the open water. It might reach, or it might collapse under my weight. Didn't have much choice. I left the seal carcass behind, grabbed my rifle, and sprinted across the ice, the sled bouncing wildly. I got to the edge, looked down at the black, churning water heart was pounding like a drum in my ears. Steeled my nerves. There wasn't time for hesitation, and I jumped. I landed hard. The ice groaned and shifted under my feet. I scrambled forward, not daring to look back, the sled bumping along behind me. I could hear the splash as the bears hit the water, their growls echoing across the ice. With one final lunge, I heaved myself onto solid ice, just as the strip I jumped from sheared away, leaving open water between me and my pursuers. I collapsed onto the snow, chest heaving. For a long moment, I just lay there, 
staring up at the gray sky. Then I heard a whimper. The cub. It was swimming frantically, trying to claw its way up the icy bank. Its mama was nowhere to be seen, likely swept further out by the current. Part of me felt a pang of guilt, orphaning the thing. But then I thought of those claws, those teeth that could tear a man to ribbons. I forced myself to get up, to move away from the edge. Then I shouldered my rifle, sighted down the barrel at that struggling little form, and pulled the trigger. The gunshot echoed across the ice. The cub jerked, then went still. I turned away, stomach churning. There's a brutality to survival, I reminded myself. A harshness nature demands of those who want to share her space. Still, it left a sour taste in my mouth. I trudged back towards land, the wind cutting me with icy blades. It was gonna be a long walk home, and the sun was already sinking below the horizon. The brief daylight in those latitudes doesn't give a man much leeway for mistakes. That's when I saw it, a faint light glimmering through the snow a few miles inland. Now that was strange. There weren't any settlements in that direction. I hesitated. That light could be salvation, or something else entirely. Curiosity battled against caution in my tired mind. In the end, the need for shelter and warmth, maybe even a hot meal, won out. I changed course, setting my sights on the mysterious glow. As I got closer, I realized it was an old trapper's cabin. Must have been abandoned for years, but it looked sturdy enough. I approached with my rifle ready, just in case the place wasn't as empty as it first appeared. The door creaked open reluctantly. Inside, it was dark and smelled musty, but dry. I'd built a small fire in the hearth with what I found stacked outside, shedding some light and a little warmth into the single room. There was a battered old bunk with a thin, moth-eaten blanket. Some rusted cookware hung on a nail, an emptied can of beans on a shelf. Whoever last stayed here had left in a hurry or had met a bad end. Neither scenario was comforting at that moment, to be honest. But exhaustion won out over my nagging unease. I ate some jerky I always carried, then wrapped myself in the blanket on the bunk and tried to get some rest. Outside the wind howled, but for the first time in a long, long time, I wasn't completely alone out there in the ice-bound wilderness. I must have drifted off, because I awoke with a jolt to the sound of scratching. It came from inside the cabin. I froze, listened intently. There it was again, louder this time, coming from under the bunk. There was something alive in there with me. I eased off the bunk, rifle raised, knelt down and peered into the gloom. The scratching had stopped as soon as I moved. For a moment all was silent, and then I saw them two glowing eyes reflecting back the faint firelight. They blinked, then a scrawny head emerged, followed by a hairless, elongated body. It was a creature, more beast than dog, with wrinkled, grayish skin and a mouthful of needle teeth. God knows how long it had been trapped under the bunk, starving. The creature stared at me, whimpered. I stared back, mind racing. Part of me wanted to end its misery, one clean shot, and this nightmare of a day would take one final, dark twist. But some flicker of twisted pity stirred in me. This thing was more victim of circumstance than a genuine threat. I fished in my pack for the last of my jerky and tossed it towards the creature. It scurried forward, snatched up the meat, then retreated back into darkness tearing into the food with desperate hunger. I sat back on the bunk, shivering, my mind a jumbled mess. The bears, the cub, this wretched creature under my feet, the day had taken a toll far beyond exhaustion. And through it all, there was an unsettling thought gnawing at me. If someone, 
or something, had been using this cabin, where were they now? Morning brought no answers, only the bleak, white sameness of the Arctic landscape. I gathered my things, leaving some more jerky for whatever lived beneath the bunk. Something told me that both of us, trapped in different ways, would need all the scraps of kindness this harsh world could offer. I never learned what the light was that first drew me to the cabin. Maybe just another trick of the ice, playing with a man's mind when he's at his most vulnerable. I also never saw another trace of those bears. Part of me hopes Mama Bear made it back to shore, that the vastness of the wilderness could swallow even a loss like the one she suffered. As for me, I returned to Nome. For a while, the ice held no appeal. But come spring, come the call of the wild once more, I was back out there. The memory of that day, of the choices I made, and the eyes that glowed from the darkness, traveled with me. It's a weight you learn to carry, out there on the edge of the world. This happened to me on June 23, 2010. I was working as a deputy with the Sheriff's Department in Payson, Arizona, just a small town nestled up in the pines. Been a cop for about five years then. You'd get used to the quiet life, handle the occasional domestic dispute, maybe a drunk driver once in a while. Payson's the kind of place where everybody knows each other. I'm Mark Bennett. First call of the day seems simple enough. Mrs. Elwood runs the little general goods store down on Main Street, reports a petty theft. A teenage kid nabbed a bag of chips and a candy bar. I drive out, talk to Mrs. Elwood, a sweet, elderly lady with a heart of gold and a tongue that could flay a man alive if he crossed her. Kid's name is Danny Owens, troublemaker from way back. His ma's a mess, always in and out of rehab. I know the Owens place, a rundown trailer out by the creek. Seems like the ideal place to catch young Danny red-handed. I head out, the cruiser bumping down the dirt road that winds along the creek. Trailers here aren't fancy, but the Owens place has seen better days. Windows patched up with duct tape, yard a mess of rusted car parts and old tires. The air hangs heavy with the smell of stale beer and something else I can't quite place. I knock on the warp screen door, no answer. The quiet is unnerving. Place feels empty. I walk around back, keeping an eye out. See an open window with the screen busted out. That's how Danny probably got in and out but it sends a shiver down my spine. I call out his name again, then decide to head in. Mrs. Owens, if she's home, won't like me barging in, but there's something off that I can't shake. Inside is worse than I expected. Trash furniture, beer bottles all over the floor, stains on the threadbare carpet. Looks like blood. A sense of dread settles in my gut. I hear a noise upstairs. A faint whimper. Follow the sound, gun drawn. My footsteps echo on the warped wooden floorboards. Upstairs, the kid's room is empty, his things scattered everywhere. Then I find the source of the whimpers. Huddled in a closet under a pile of dirty clothes is a little girl. No older than six or seven, with tear tracks streaking her face. My heart sinks. It's Sarah Wilson, lives a few trailers down. Went missing two days ago, nobody had any leads. I gently lift her out of the closet. She clings to me like a lifeline, her small body trembling. Where's Danny? I ask, trying to keep my voice calm. Sarah shakes her head, sobs racking her body. The, the monster, it took him. A wave of nausea washes over me. Monster? What the hell does that mean? I get Sarah out of the trailer, into the cruiser, 
and call it in. Report Mrs. Owens missing, Sarah Wilson found, and a possible child abduction in progress. My voice trembles as I say the words Sarah told me. Backup arrives fast small-town cops stick together. We toss the Owens place but find nothing except more signs of a struggle, of something, wrong. The sun's already starting to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows. We search the woods till nightfall, but Danny's nowhere to be seen. We put out an APB, but as the hours stretch into the night, the pit in my stomach tells me it's too late. Something monstrous is out there in the twilight. Something I never imagined I might face. Next morning, they call an AK-9 unit from the city. The dog picks up a scent trail heading into the denser part of the pine forest towards the old Mogollon Rim. I'm part of the team that follows, a knot of tension in my chest. The pines grow thick, filtering out the sunlight. The air hangs humid and still. Every rustle of leaves sounds like a footfall. Every branch cracking sounds like a hungry growl. The dog leads us through the maze of trees for hours. Then, up ahead, it starts barking, straining at the leash. My heart pounds a heavy rhythm in my ears. I push through the undergrowth and into a clearing. There, on the ground, is something that makes my blood run cold. It's Danny Owens, what's left of him anyway. His clothes are torn, his body twisted into an unnatural shape, like a broken doll tossed aside. The dog circles him, whining anxiously. The sight's enough to make a seasoned cop lose his lunch, but I force myself to focus, to examine the scene with all the training I can muster. Around his body are massive footprints, not animal, not human. Whatever did this was huge, powerful, and utterly vicious. One of the guys with me swears under his breath. Another makes the sign of the cross, his face pale. I search for something, anything that makes sense. But the truth is, there's no explanation for this, not one the textbooks prepared me for. I get on the radio, voice barely a whisper. I describe the wounds, the footprints, trying to keep my composure. On the other end of the line, there's silence for a long moment. Then... The chief clears his throat. Bennett, he says, his voice grim. Meet us back at the station. We need to talk. Back at the station, the atmosphere feels heavy with dread. The K-9 handler tells us what he knows, what the dog smelled, decay, and an underlying scent of rotting meat clinging to Danny's remains. That chilling detail settles in my bones. The chief calls in a specialist, a grizzled park ranger named Walker who's worked the area for decades. He's the closest thing Payson has to an expert on the wilderness. Walker listens impassively, his sun-worn face creased in thought, then says what we're all too scared to admit out loud. That ain't no animal I know of. His voice is low, rough. Something's out there. Something that don't belong in these woods. A cold fear slithers down my spine. We spend the rest of the day planning search parties, roadblocks, warning folks in the more remote areas. Payson doesn't sleep well that night. The shadows grow long and twisted. Every creak and groan of a house takes on a sinister tone. Next morning, I'm out at first light. We comb the forest in concentric circles widening out from where Danny's body was found. The pines stretch on for miles, whispering with secrets the sunlight can't reach. Tension hangs thick, making me jumpy. I know I'm not the only one. Every rustle of underbrush seems pregnant with menace. Hours go by, fruitless, agonizing hours. Then, over the radio, I hear my name called in a panicked voice. It's Johnson, one of the deputies I grew up with. His location isn't far from mine. I start running, heart in my throat. 
When I reach the clearing, I understand the fear in Johnson's voice. The scene is even more horrific than Danny's. Two hikers, a young couple from Phoenix, ripped to shreds, barely recognizable as human. And those same inhuman footprints circled around their bodies like a vulture. I swallow back the bow rising in my throat. My hands tremble as I take photos for evidence. The forest feels suffocating, filled with unseen eyes. I radio in, tell them what I found. Chief's voice crackles back, grim as death. Pull out, Bennett. All units pull out. We ain't dealing with nothing we can handle. We retreat, but the forest seems to cling to us like burrs. It's in the haunted look in my partner's eyes, in the way the trees seem to lean in. Every snap of a twig underfoot sends my pulse racing. Back in town, a quiet terror descends upon Payson. Kids aren't allowed outside. Doors are double-bolted at night. Local hunters, those usually brash and boisterous men, suddenly go silent. News crews descend like flies, hungry for the story and the rising body count. Walker calls in some favors, gets us reinforcements from the city, even a few federal agents. They come armed with heavy-duty rifles and night-vision equipment, determined faces set beneath tactical helmets. For a brief moment, we feel hopeful. Like maybe, just maybe, these guys can handle whatever monstrosity hides in our woods. Those hopes are cruelly dashed. The attacks continue, growing bolder and more frequent. The monster, whatever it is, learns our patterns strikes where we're weakest. It picks off a lone patrolman, ambushes an FBI team, shreds them apart with the same terrible strength. We find the bodies, but the feds leave. They cut their losses and return to the city lights. Leave us, the small-town cops, to face the darkness alone. The monster becomes a part of life in Payson, an ugly, twisted part. We don't talk about it much, not aloud at least, but it colors everything we do. The general store closes early. Kids don't play in the street after dusk. Hunters don't venture into those cursed woods anymore. We patrol in pairs, always on edge, knowing every radio call might be our last. Some people leave Payson. Can't say I blame them. I think about it sometimes, too. I've got a cousin in Phoenix, a sister in Flagstaff. Could start over somewhere new, somewhere where the shadows don't whisper of hungry claws. But most of us stay. This is our home. We dig in, stubborn as ever. The months bleed into years, the attacks less frequent but no less brutal. We never get a good look at the beast, just fleeting glimpses in the night. Massive, lumbering on two legs, eyes glinting in the darkness like dying embers. Some believe it's a bear, driven mad with disease. Others whisper rumors of old Native American curses, or skinwalkers, or things even less savory. I try not to listen, try to stick to the facts. But the facts are that we're powerless, that the monster still rules the trees. And the aftermath? I guess it hasn't happened yet at least not completely. Some wounds never heal, some scars never fade. Me? I got a few new gray hairs. Payson's got a lot less people and a lot more locked doors. Once in a while, something disappears off the edges of town a dog, sometimes a drifter passing through. We don't talk about it. We bury the memory deep, along with all the ones we've lost. And we wait, we watch, we endure. This happened to me in the spring of 1993. My name's Wyatt Jensen, and I live, lived, in a remote cabin outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. 
The Coconino National Forest is my backyard, a vast expanse of pines, canyons, and rugged volcanic peaks. I worked on trail maintenance for the Forest Service at the time. Loved the solitude, and the work wasn't half bad. One evening, I was heading back after fixing up a trailhead sign that had been knocked over, probably by some drunk campers. Twilight was creeping in, those long desert shadows casting everything in an eerie, blue-tinged light. It put me on edge, but I figured it was just the loneliness creeping in as it always does out here. Then I saw it, a flash of movement by a stand of pines. Thinking it was a deer, I slowed down. My dog, Rusty, a big lab mix who was always by my side, let out a low growl. Then I caught a whiff of it, something foul, like rotting meat mingled with an unfamiliar, musky odor. Easy, boy, I muttered to Rusty, putting a hand on his collar. That's when the thing emerged from the trees. My heart skipped a beat. Standing on two legs, it was about eight feet tall, covered in shaggy, dark fur that matted into clumps. Its arms were disproportionately long and ended in enormous claws that dragged against the ground. Its head, well, it bore a slight resemblance to a wolf, misshapen and elongated, with bared teeth and eyes that burned like embers. I froze, rusty whimpered, his tail between his legs. Neither of us had ever seen anything like it. The creature stared, blinked those hellish eyes, then tilted its head to one side, almost as if appraising me. Then, it dropped to all fours and bolted towards us, its gait a horrifying mixture of animalistic power and awkward, gangly movements. Rusty, go! I yelled, letting go of his collar. He took off like a shot, barking in terror. I fumbled for the pistol I kept at my hip, heart pounding against my ribs. The creature was gaining ground fast, its low snarl echoing through the trees. I turned and ran, scrambling over rocks and fallen logs, branches slashing at my face. I knew I couldn't outrun it for long, but I had to try. Behind me, Rusty's bark suddenly cut off in a sharp, pained yelp. My stomach twisted. I risked a glance back. Rusty was struggling on the ground, those massive claws raking his back. Rusty! I yelled, but he couldn't break free. The creature lifted him easily, like he was no heavier than a rabbit. A sickening ripping sound tore through the air, followed by a whimper that was mercifully short. It dropped what was left of my dog and turned its attention back to me. Panic fueled me. I fired a warning shot into the air. The noise reverberated in the silent woods, but the creature barely flinched. It was almost on top of me, reeking of death. I aimed for its chest. The first bullet hit. I knew it from the pained growl. The second shot went wide as it lunged, knocking the pistol from my hand. I stumbled backward, losing my footing. The creature stalked toward me, its clawed hand outstretched. In that moment, I knew with sickening certainty I was about to die. Then, from behind the monster, I heard a woman scream. The creature paused, then twisted its head. My heart leaped. Three figures stood at the edge of the clearing, two men and a woman, all armed with rifles. Wyatt, get down! The woman yelled. I barely understood the words before gunfire ripped through the air. The beast let out a deafening bellow. I squeezed my eyes shut, scrambling back against a tree. When I dared to open them, the creature was thrashing on the ground, black-red blood staining its fur. One of the men, a burly guy with a Native American accent I vaguely recognized, stepped closer and fired once more into its head. With a final shudder, it went still. The silence was deafening. I sat there, shaking, 
staring at the monstrous form lying amidst the dry needles and crushed leaves. The woman, her dark hair in a tight braid, hurried to my side. Are you all right? she asked, putting a hand on my shoulder. I managed to nod. Who, who are you? I stammered. We're hunters, the older of the two men said. His lined face was grim. We've been tracking this thing for weeks. Killed two of our friends. It's a skinwalker. I stared at him in disbelief, the words stirring some vague memory from childhood Navajo stories my grandpa used to tell. The woman crouched down by the creature's body, her brow furrowing. This one's young, she said, then gave me a sharp look. You're lucky you weren't alone out here, and that you survived to tell the tale. They helped me gather my things, the pistol lying useless on the ground. I didn't even look back at Rusty, the memory too raw. It was surreal, walking alongside the hunters, the creature's monstrous corpse slung over a makeshift stretcher. They didn't say much on the way back to my cabin, the only sounds the crunch of our boots and my ragged breath. Back at my place, the burly man, who introduced himself as Joe, spoke first, breaking the heavy silence. We need to burn it. Tonight. Skinwalkers, their spirit gets released if you don't destroy the body. But won't, wouldn't someone come looking for? I started, unable to finish the question. It felt absurd to worry about police reports and missing person lists when the proof lay just outside the cabin door. The woman, who I learned was named Callie, gave me a sympathetic look. No one will, Wyatt. They operate between worlds, these things. That's how they get away with it for so long. Joe nodded. We'll take care of it. You should get some rest. This ain't something you forget easy. I did as instructed, mechanically making a semblance of dinner, trying to numb the churning mix of horror and disbelief in my stomach. Later, as I lay in bed, the cabin felt unnaturally empty and cold. I couldn't get the image of the creature out of my head or the sound of Rusty's cries. Sometime near midnight, the crack of gunfire jolted me awake. I sat bolt upright in bed, the silence that followed seeming even more ominous. I crept to the window, peeking out. In the clearing bathed in moonlight, a bonfire raged, flames licking the night sky. I watched, mesmerized and horrified, as they fed the creature's body into the fire, the once terrifying form contorting and melting in the heat. The next few days passed in a daze. People came, forest service folks, local law enforcement. I told them about a bear attack, which sounded ridiculous even to myself, but I didn't know what else to say. Somehow, the hunters remained invisible through it all. Joe and Callie came by often, at first to make sure I was physically okay, then just to check in. They told me bits and pieces about skinwalkers, the lore that was passed down in their communities. Shapeshifters, witches, bound to evil, with an insatiable hunger for human flesh. They were the protectors, the ones keeping this part of the world safe. At least, trying to. A few weeks later, they took me on a hike in a remote part of the forest. We stopped by a quiet stream. Joe handed me a small, leather-bound pouch. There's something for ya, he grunted. Protection. Inside was a silver pendant shaped like a wolf's head, its eyes made of gleaming turquoise. I put it on, its weight cool against my skin. Callie smiled, reaching out to touch the pendant. It's blessed. Not foolproof, mind you, but it helps. You think, think it'll come back? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. She sighed. There's always others. But they won't sense you as easily now. You're one of us, like it or not. I swallowed hard. 
the words had a strange sense of finality to them. It's been a long time since that happened. I still live in the woods, but not in Arizona. I moved to Vermont, to a different kind of forest, green and dense, less open and menacing than the pines of the southwest. Joe and Callie sometimes visit. We drink beers on my porch, tell stories the public would never believe, and keep an eye out for shadows that flicker a bit too long by the trees at night. Sometimes I see reports of missing hikers or strange animal attacks, and I wonder, is it one of them? Have they moved on? I haven't been out west since, and I don't think I will be. I carry the weight of what happened with me, the memory of Rusty, and the knowledge that monsters hide even in the most beautiful of places. The pendant remains around my neck, a silent reminder. I'm older now, the lines on my face mirroring Joe's. He says I'm becoming a guardian of sorts, someone who knows the truth even if he can't say it out loud. Sometimes, late at night, I wonder if I hear the faint echoes of paws on the packed dirt of my yard, or if it's just the wind. I keep a shotgun by the door, just in case. My name is Declan Knox, and this happened to me on September 13, 1997. Back then, I was green, fresh out of the academy and full of that naive conviction that comes with a brand new badge and a gun. My wife used to tease me about it, eyes twinkling as she'd iron out the rookie creases from my uniform each morning. I'd have done anything for her. Anything except this. Our assignment seemed innocuous enough, reports of strange noises and sightings in Olympic National Park in Washington State. Bigfoot country, the locals joked. They told tales around campfires to spook tourists. I scoffed along with them, the city boy playing at wilderness savvy. Bigfoot wasn't real. We were there for a poacher, maybe some illegal campers wreaking havoc on the ecosystem standard stuff. Our team was small, just me, Peterson, and our veteran tracker, Harris. Harris was a mountain of a man, grizzled, with hands the size of dinner plates and eyes that seemed to see right through a person. He never said much about his background, but the whispers were that he'd been some kind of special forces type before finding solace in the tangled green heart of the forest. We spent the first few days covering familiar ground, meticulously checking recently vacated campsites and following established trails. I started to question if this was a colossal waste of taxpayer dollars. Peterson, an easygoing guy with a perpetual grin, joked that at least we were earning our hazard pay. And then, we started finding things. The first was a half-eaten elk carcass, stripped to the bone with an unnatural efficiency. No animal I knew would leave a kill so clean. But there were no tracks, nothing but some ruffled feathers and patches of trampled ferns. That night, an unearthly cry echoed through the trees, a mournful wail that vibrated through my bones like an icy wind. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. The next morning, we found more, a campsite obliterated as if by a localized tornado, shredded tents, gear strewn across the ground. We followed a trail of destruction deeper into the woods, each new discovery sending a fresh wave of unease down my spine. Then we came across the blood. It splattered the base of a massive redwood, bright red against the damp, mossy bark. I followed the trail with dread pooling in my gut, my gun drawn. It led into a tangle of undergrowth, and what I found in that shadowed thicket would forever change my world. Peterson was sprawled amidst the bracken, his face a mask of frozen horror. His throat was torn open, the fatal wound a ragged mess of flesh and blood. 
His eyes bulged in a way that spoke of an unimaginable terror in his last moments. And in the wet soil next to his body was a footprint. It was enormous, easily twice the size of a human foot, with deep indentations left by claws. It was fresh, the mud still damp in the crevices. Something big, something powerful, had done this. Harris knelt beside the body, his face grim. Not a bear, he said, his voice low. And thank God, not a big foot either. I didn't laugh. I was too busy trying not to throw up. That's when the hunt turned. Peterson was victim number one but not the last. Every night, that mournful cry echoed through the trees, and every morning we'd find more traces of devastation and death. Locals gone missing, their homes ransacked with the same chilling violence we'd witnessed at the campsite. Tourists vanished into thin air the moment they strayed from the beaten path. The official story was a rogue grizzly, maybe a serial killer on the loose. Harris, the other rangers, and I, we knew the truth. We hunted it, following a trail of blood and bone that crisscrossed the rain-soaked forest. We caught glimpses in the twilight, a flash of massive yellow eyes, a hunched silhouette blacker than the night itself dissolving into the shadows. One evening, as we hunkered down in a makeshift camp, I dared to ask Harris a question that had been gnawing at me. What the hell is that thing out there? He took a long drag of his cigarette, exhaling smoke that twisted into spectral shapes in the fading light. My granddad, he was a logger in these parts, Harris said, his voice tinged with the hushed reverence of old legends. He told stories about a creature from his people's tales. A spirit of rage, of vengeance. They called it the Wendigo. His words sent a shiver down my spine. The Wendigo, a monstrous, emaciated figure born from Native American folklore. Some versions described it with the head of a stag, others with burning eyes and razor-sharp claws. All agreed on one thing. It was an insatiable predator, driven by an unending hunger. My city-trained mind scoffed but every fiber of my being screamed that Harris was right. We weren't hunting an animal. We were stalking a myth made flesh. I started seeing it everywhere. Every creaking bough was its impossibly long limbs stretching towards me. Every shadow flickered with its unnatural shape. The forest, once familiar, became an oppressive maze teeming with unseen malice. And then it found us. It came for us under the cloak of a moonless night. Our campfire was a beacon in the suffocating darkness, casting our huddled forms in stark shadow play against the ancient trees. I clutched my rifle, fingers numb, every rustle amplified into a monstrous approach. The attack was a blur of chaos. Harris, ever the seasoned woodsman, was the first to see it, a guttural roar from his throat was our only warning before it burst from the tree line, an impossible blur of speed and fury. It moved like a wraith, a grotesque hybrid of human and beast. Towering, impossibly lean, its skin stretched taut over bone, its eyes burning with that same savage yellow glow I recalled from glimpses in the woods. Harris fired, and the sound cracked the silent night. But the creature was unnaturally fast, dodging his shots with chilling agility. It slammed into him, sending the big man tumbling like a ragdoll. A sickening crunch echoed through the clearing, and Harris didn't get up. Terror fueled my limbs as I fired blindly at the creature, the shots echoing uselessly into the encroaching darkness. It shrieked, a piercing sound that set my teeth on edge and whirled towards me. I caught a glimpse of its maw, a gaping chasm filled with rows of needle-like teeth, dripping with blood. Then it lunged. Time seemed to slow. I saw the claws arcing towards me, smelled the fetid stench of its breath. 
I knew, in that suspended second, that I was going to die just like Peterson, like all the others. Then came a new sound, the staccato bark of automatic gunfire, and tracers stitched the night. The creature screeched again, this time in pain. It staggered, the force of the bullets driving it back. Searchlights pierced the darkness, cutting through the trees with blinding intensity. Voices barked orders, and then they were there, figures emerging from the shadows, armed, their movements purposeful and deadly. The creature hesitated, then turned and vanished back into the forest with a final hate-filled roar. Relief washed over me in a crashing wave, leaving me trembling and nauseous. And in the harsh glare of the floodlights, I saw that the reinforcements weren't the cops I'd been praying for. They wore unmarked combat fatigues, faces obscured behind balaclavas. The way they moved, the cold efficiency in their eyes, these were soldiers, or something worse. One of them approached me, his movements unnervingly silent. Son, your hunt is over, he said, his voice flat and devoid of emotion. They collected Harris's broken body, confiscated our gear, swabbed us with a quick motion that spoke of routine medical examinations. Our questions were met with curt warnings. National security. Classified. The next few days were a blur. Debriefings in sterile rooms, veiled threats, and the ever-present awareness of being watched. I felt like a fly caught in an intricate web, powerless. Then came the offer, join their unit, become part of the silent war against the creatures that lurked in the shadows, the creatures the world wasn't supposed to know existed. Or walk away and pray the monsters didn't come for me in the night. I thought of Peterson, his easy grin. Of Harris, the seasoned veteran felled with such brutal efficiency. Most of all, I thought of my wife, her warm smile as she kissed me goodbye each morning. I couldn't let whatever was out there take her too. I said yes. They wiped our team's official report clean of any mention of the creature. Chalked it up to a rogue bear, an elusive psychopath. The lies were a bitter pill to swallow, but I understood the necessity. The world wasn't ready for the truth, not yet. I learned quickly that I'd become a cog in a much larger machine, a machine dedicated to containing the monstrous reality that lurked on the fringes of our world. We operate in the shadows, on the edge of society. Deployments come with no warning taking us to desolate corners of the world where desperate locals whisper rumors of the unnatural. Each mission is a gamble, each encounter a chilling reminder of the impossible odds we face. I've seen death in a hundred grisly forms and learned to bury the nightmares under a facade of cold professionalism. My wife thinks I'm a government consultant, always on the road for vague, hush-hush assignments. I lie to her every day to shield her from the horrifying truth, and the guilt gnaws at me. But I made my choice, and I won't be another name on a casualty list. It's been ten years since that night in Olympic National Park. The world spins on, oblivious to the horrors that lie in wait just beyond the veil of normalcy. Our unit carries its grim secrets, a brotherhood born of blood and shared trauma. The public sees unexplained disappearances, mangled corpses attributed to animal attacks or the work of madmen. They dismiss it, turn the page, and go back to their lives. Let them. It's better that way. For as long as we draw breath, we will stand between the darkness and the light. My name is Declan Knox, and I hunt monsters. It's a thankless... Unending war, fought one gruesome battle at a time. But if that's what it takes to keep the world safe, to keep my loved ones safe, then I'll pay the price in blood and sanity. Because out there, the Wendigo waits, and there will always be others, others lurking in the shadows.
My name is Caleb Ross, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2012. I work. Well, let's just say my job isn't listed on LinkedIn. Some folks in dark suits offered me the gig after a stint in the army left me a bit restless for the quiet life. I'll kill anything with claws or fangs for the right price. That's the simple version. This particular job involved a string of disappearances in Glacier National Park, Montana. Beautiful place. Hikers vanishing into thin air, no blood, no bodies, just abandoned backpacks and half-eaten granola bars. My gut told me it was a mountain lion that had gotten a taste for human flesh. The Park Service wanted it alive for study which paid better than a trophy for some rich lunatic's wall, so I agreed. I'm good at what I do, but even the best hunters sometimes step in shit. I spent a week in those woods. Found tracks, big ones, but nothing recent. Locals swore they heard roars in the night, echoing off the peaks. But mountain lions roar to stake out territory, not to lure and prey. That's when the doubts crept in. What was I really tracking out here? Day seven, I made my move. I staked out a fresh kill, a deer carcass, half devoured, high in a remote valley. I set up a hide on the opposite ridge, night vision rifle ready. If it was just a big cat, this was my best chance. As dusk turned to night, the forest took on a different shape. Shadows deepened. Every snap of a twig made me jump. But it wasn't the sound of approaching paws that had me tensing. It was the silence. The woods had gone dead quiet. That's when I saw it. A figure slipping through the trees, more shadow than substance. Humanoid in shape, but moving on all fours, weirdly hunched. Its skin seemed to shimmer in the moonlight, pale and hairless. I raised the rifle, finger hovering over the trigger. In the scope's infrared glow, it turned to face me. And Jesus, those eyes! They burned like embers, filled not with animal instinct but a cold, calculating intelligence. That wasn't a beast, it was something else entirely. A shiver ran down my spine. I'd heard the stories— things most people dismiss as tall tales told around campfires. The part of me that still believed in monsters, the part I'd tried to bury, screamed at me to get the hell out of there. But I held my ground. I'm no coward, and part of me, a reckless part, burned with a hunter's curiosity. What the hell was that thing? It crouched lower, muscles rippling beneath its skin. It studied me, not as a predator sizing up its next meal, but as something, older, smarter, assessing a threat. Then it spoke. Not with words, exactly, but a guttural sound echoing in my mind, scraping at my sanity. Go away. Hunt elsewhere. This place is mine. It was a warning. And in that terrible, impossible moment, I understood. That thing wasn't an animal I could track and kill. It was far more dangerous than any predator I'd ever faced. I lowered the rifle. Some might call me a fool. But there's a line between bravery and stupidity, and I wasn't about to cross it. Slowly, deliberately, I backed away, keeping my gaze locked on the creature. It watched, unmoving, until I disappeared back into the trees. I stumbled down the mountainside, half-crazed with a mix of terror and adrenaline. I never looked back. When I reached the ranger station at dawn, I had a story already, mountain lion, too cunning for me to track. I quit the job, walked away without asking for the paycheck. The nightmares started soon after. That thing's eyes burning into mine. The voice in my head, a low rasp of inhuman power. I saw a shrink for a while, tried to convince myself it was all PTSD flashbacks from my time in the sandbox. Didn't work. 
I know what I saw. Here's the thing. I haven't hunted since. Took a job as a security contractor. Dull as dirt but lets me sleep at night. Sometimes, I drive up to Glacier, take a hike, try to convince myself it was just a trick of the light, a hallucination brought on by too much isolation. But deep down, I know the truth. There are things out there far older and more terrible than we can comprehend, things that hide in plain sight. And sometimes, if you're really unlucky, they see you back. Let me tell you, staring down the barrel of an enemy rifle is nothing compared to the cold, crawling fear that thing left behind. I don't know what it is, or why it let me live. All I know is that somewhere in those mountains, it's still waiting. My name's Marcus Pierce, and this happened to me back in September of 2011. Back then, I was running with a specialized CIA team, the sort they tapped for missions that blurred the line between military and science fiction. It was the sort of job where you never told your wife your real destination, and your family thought you worked in insurance or something equally boring. This particular assignment was weird from the start. Something about seismic sensors picking up unusual activity in a remote part of the Great Smoky Mountains. Locals whispered about strange disappearances, and the bigwigs were worried there could be some sort of secret paramilitary operation setting up shop on American soil. We went in expecting to find a rebel camp, not the nightmare we actually found. There were three of us, Torres, Jackson, and me. Torres was our tech specialist, the sort of quiet genius who could hack a satellite one minute, then crack a self-deprecating joke the next. Jackson was muscle with a heart of gold, a former marine with a grin that could make a nun blush. He called me Grandpa, since technically I was the oldest. We spent two weeks slogging through those hauntingly beautiful mountains. The air was thick with the smell of pine and damp undergrowth. It felt like there was something watching us, every snap of a twig setting us on edge. Torres kept picking up strange readings, but every time we closed in, it was like whatever we were tracking vanished into thin air. One evening, we set up camp near a shallow cave system. Jackson rigged the perimeter with trip wires and motion detectors, his usual meticulous routine. The rest of us were exhausted, but Torres couldn't leave the sensors alone. He kept muttering about energy spikes that didn't make any sense. Torres enough, I finally told him. We'll check it out in the morning, get some sleep. The next thing I remember is the earth shaking and a cacophony of noise that shredded the night's quiet. Tree branches cracked. Rocks tumbled down the slope. Jackson yelled something before it all drowned out in a sound like the world splitting open. I scrambled for my rifle, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. Jackson was shouting, grabbing his own gear. Torres fumbled with his equipment. The sensors... They're going haywire. Before we could react, the top half of a fallen tree crashed through the mouth of the cave. Dust choked the air, and something lumbered out of the shadows. It stood at least nine feet tall, its form both monstrous and oddly human. Its skin had a rough, mottled texture, mottled in shades of brown and gray like old tree bark. Its legs were impossibly long and powerful its arms ending in vicious black claws. The thing's eyes burned like embers in its craggy, almost skeletal head. We froze in sheer shock. This wasn't a rebel or a guy in a suit. This was a nightmare ripped from the darkest corner of the forest. It let out a screech that shook the cave, a deafening mixture of animal roar and something else. Then it charged. I opened fire, the gun bucking in my hands. Torres and Jackson joined in, 
a deafening barrage of bullets echoing through the confined space. The creature staggered under the onslaught but didn't go down. It ripped one of Jackson's motion sensors free with a swipe of its claws, the metal twisting like a paper clip. Jackson, move! Torres yelled. Jackson scrambled back, but too slow. The creature lunged for him, its massive jaws snapping shut inches from his face. Jackson brought up his rifle and fired point-blank into the creature's chest. Blood splattered, dark and thick, and the thing roared in pain. But it wasn't enough. With sickening speed, the creature swiped its claws across Jackson's midsection. He let out a strangled cry, dropping his rifle and crumpling to the ground. The creature moved to finish him. No! I roared and charged at the beast, slamming the butt of my rifle into its head. It reeled back, momentarily disoriented. Torres seized the chance, sprinting past and dragging Jackson further into the cave. I followed, firing backwards to buy them time. The creature turned its blazing eyes on me. It lunged, and I barely dodged, rolling to the side as a shower of dirt and rock exploded where I'd been standing. The cave narrowed behind me. Panic prickled at the back of my neck. There was no escape route. We were backed into a corner. Up ahead, I could hear Torres grunting with the effort of moving Jackson, the sounds echoing back ominously. Leave him! I shouted, my voice ragged. We wouldn't all make it out of this. Like hell I will! Torres' voice cracked with grief and defiance. The creature stalked towards us, a horrifying picture of unnatural resilience against our onslaught. Its chest wound was bad, but it wasn't slowing down. Each ragged breath it took whistled through the bloody gash, a gruesome soundtrack to our impending doom. My rifle clicked empty. Desperate, I drew my sidearm. A few more shots, maybe I could at least slow the damn thing down. I emptied my remaining bullets into the creature with grim determination. It roared, staggering but relentless. Torres shouted in the distance maybe a plea, maybe a curse. Every cell in my body screamed at me to run, but my feet felt rooted to the spot. Then, a flicker of movement in the cave's depths. Torres emerged, a look of terrible resolve on his face. In his hand was a bundle of something that glowed with a strange, pulsing light. Thermobaric grenades, Torres gasped, his voice tight with the effort of dragging them. I rigged them with a remote trigger, figure we go out with a bang. It was madness, desperation, and probably the only chance we had left. Cover me! I yelled, lunging forward. The creature, distracted by Torres' sudden reappearance, roared in fury. My shoulders and elbows connected with its side, a jarring, bone-bruising impact. I'd barely managed to force it to turn, opening up a narrow corridor to where Torres had dragged Jackson further back into the cave. Then I turned and ran. Behind me, I heard the creature's bellow of rage, Torres' frantic shouts, the heavy thump of Jackson's wounded body being dragged with grim determination. It felt like forever before I reached Torres. Jackson lay on the damp ground, his face pale. With trembling hands, Torres pushed the detonator into my grip. We clear? He gasped. Clear? I choked, giving him a twisted, bitter grin. The creature had nearly reached us, a grotesque silhouette against the dwindling light of the cave entrance. It howled in primal fury, a sound that crawled under my skin, the promise of a violent end. I thumbed the detonator. One press, and we'd all vanish in a blinding flash. At least the mission would be a success, in the twisted calculus of our shadowed world. Goodbye, my friend. Torres whispered, giving a shaky salute that tore at my already frayed composure. 
the creature was lunging for us. I squeezed my eyes shut, finger tightening on the trigger. In my mind I saw my wife smile, heard my kids' laughter, images of a life forever out of reach. A flicker of regret tightened my chest, but it was snuffed out by the hot wash of adrenaline and duty. Then a strange noise, like the rustling of countless dry leaves, filled the cave. I opened my eyes. The creature had frozen mid-stride. Its burning eyes widened, not with rage, but with a chilling flicker of confusion. The ground beneath it seemed to writhe, long, sinuous shapes bursting from the cracked stone and coiling around it with impossible speed. They were like vines— but a sickly, pale color, pulsing with a strange inner light. The creature thrashed, its roars turning into high-pitched screeches of agony as the tendrils tightened, squeezing the life from its monstrous form. I could only watch, dumbstruck. Torres slumped beside me, his mouth working soundlessly, eyes wide with a mix of horror and fascination. Then, as quickly as they had appeared— the pale vines began to melt away, oozing back into the ground like a grotesque, retreating tide. The creature collapsed with a final, shuddering thud, its eyes dimming, its body left a mangled, inert heap. Silence descended, broken only by the ragged sound of our own breathing. Jackson, still unconscious, groaned in pain. Shaking, I knelt beside him and checked for a pulse. It was weak but steady. He'd live. The caves stank of the creature's thick blood and something else, an acrid, earthy odor that made my stomach churn. Torres crept toward the creature's body, moving with the cautious precision of a scientist confronted by the unknown. He reached down, a gloved hand dipping into the black pool of blood, then recoiled with a hiss, shaking his fingers as if scalded. It burns, he said, a tremor in his voice. Whatever that thing was, it's not natural. We carried Jackson out of the cave just as dawn painted the sky in streaks of gray and pink. The cool morning air was a relief after the close, blood-soaked air of the underground. We collapsed near a mossy boulder, exhausted and shaken. Questions swirled in my head a storm of confusion fueled by adrenaline and the lingering fear of that monstrous creature. The retrieval team arrived a few hours later, drawn by our emergency signal, armed for a bear or some crazed militia. What they found was a cave splattered with blood, the creature's mangled carcass, and three hollow-eyed survivors trying to process the impossible. The aftermath, as always, was the messy part, debriefings, evaluations, and the piercing silences from the brass that spoke volumes. Torres tried to explain about the creature, but they dismissed him. Wild animal attack fueled by shock, they said. They patched me up, pronounced me fit for duty, and shoved the whole incident under a bureaucratic rug labeled classified. Some time later, I found Torres at a bar we used to frequent after particularly rough missions. He didn't even need to say anything. He ordered me a shot, something strong that burned on the way down, and we just sat together in the dim light. I keep seeing it, Torres said finally, staring into his glass. The way it moved those eyes. Yeah, me too. Jackson too. My voice trailed off. There was nothing to be said, really. I never went back to the CIA. I drifted for a while, taking odd jobs here and there. Haunted. Each creak of a floorboard, every flicker of shadow, brings it back. The Great Smoky Mountains, a place of terrible beauty. Jackson's laugh and Torah's quiet brilliance, lost forever within its depths. And always, the creature, its yellow eyes blazing in the darkness, a stark reminder that some battles can't be won, some things can't be unseen. Nights are the worst. I dream of that cave. 
I dream of the impossible pale vines, a deeper, more ancient form of life hidden beneath the earth. And I always wake wondering, with a cold dread settling deep in my bones, did they truly kill the creature? Or did they only drive it deeper back into whatever abyss it crawled from? My name is Miles Harrison, and this happened to me in the spring of 2012. I'm a covert ops specialist for the CIA. That's the cleaned-up version. The truth is I handled the dirty work no official report will ever acknowledge. Spent half my life overseas, in the shadows, so when they tell me to pack my bags for a domestic assignment, I know something's gone seriously wrong. The briefing was short and unsettling. Outbreaks of extreme violence in a stretch of remote Appalachian forest land. Multiple missing persons reports. Mostly out-of-town hikers and campers the kind easily dismissed as accidents, if not for the sheer volume. My gut instinct said drug cartel, gone feral off-grid. Seen things like that in South America. But this was America and my superiors were jumpy, whispering about bioterrorism and the like. I set up camp near the edge of the forest, an old fishing shack on a barely used road. Locals weren't much help. Tight-lipped, looking at me like I was the threat, not whatever lurked in those woods. They called the disappearances, the hush, folks go in, nobody comes out, no bodies ever found. Spent my first few days doing recon. The forest was eerily silent. Not the normal chirps and rustles of life, but a heavy, oppressive quiet that settled over you like a damp blanket. Even in the height of summer, there was a coldness in the air that made my skin crawl. A couple of times I heard noises. Shuffling sounds the crack of a branch, but too far away to pinpoint. It felt like being watched, a prickly sensation of unseen eyes tracking my every move. I started leaving trail markers, bits of colored fabric tied to trees, a broken twig propped against a rock. Just little things, but the kind of savvy tracker like myself could notice if they were disturbed. Then, on my fifth night out, something changed. An animal, I told myself at first— big one. Maybe a bear. The low growls were guttural, laced with something I wouldn't label hunger. It circled my cabin, close enough that I could hear it breathing, feel the vibrations of its footsteps against the worn floorboards. I holed up inside, rifle trained on the door. Adrenaline thrummed through me, the taste of copper in my mouth. Part of me, the old operative part, was coldly assessing the perimeter, the weak points, how long I could hold out. And then it let loose a howl, a high-pitched screech that split the night and made my blood run cold. This wasn't a bear. It wasn't any damn thing I could name. The sun rose, and the noises stopped. I ventured out cautiously, weapon at the ready. All was still, but the cabin had been marked— Shallow claw marks across the door, and splatters of something dark and sticky that I didn't want to identify. I spent the day setting traps, the kind used on big game in Africa, and rigging the perimeter with motion sensor lights. My hands moved efficiently, but my mind raced. This assignment went way beyond my pay grade. I needed backup, experts, anyone who could explain what in the fresh hell I was up against. The radio signal was spotty out here. I finally managed to get a message out, garbled, full of static, but enough to get the point across that the situation was officially out of control. The reply was curt, promising a team en route. Estimated arrival, two days. Two days with my back against the wall, alone against whatever stalked these woods. Night fell, and it brought terror with it. My traps remained undisturbed, 
a testament to whatever creature was hunting me being too cunning, or too unnatural, to be caught like an animal. The noises were different this time, more purposeful. I picked up movement on two corners of the cabin simultaneously. Then the roof. A low rasping sound, like nails across slate. I fired at the ceiling, more out of panic than strategy. Wood splintered, revealing a glimpse of the night sky and, dear God, two eyes glowing crimson in the darkness. I scrambled back as something heavy landed on the floorboards above me, causing the whole cabin to groan in protest. Panic fueled me now. I threw a flare out the window, the burst of light momentarily cutting through the gloom. It was then that I truly saw it, a blur of bone-white flesh streaked with dried blood, a skeletal torso balanced on impossibly long limbs that ended in vicious claws. Its head, it had the shape of a human skull, but stretched and twisted into something wrong, a gaping maw lined with rows of serrated teeth. I fired at it. Bullets ripped into its form, and it howled in rage, but didn't go down. It tore through the roof, escaping with a final screech that echoed in my ears long after the maddening silence had returned. The aftermath of the attack was pure chaos. The flare had lit some of the undergrowth, sending flames racing through the dry brush. I had to move, get out ahead of the inferno. Grabbing whatever gear I could salvage, I bolted out the back door as the cabin started to collapse in on itself. The fire at my back offered some twisted protection. I doubted the creature would risk the flames in pursuit, but I couldn't linger. I sprinted through the trees, the smoke and darkness blinding me, forcing me to navigate by instinct and a fading familiarity with the layout of the land from my initial recon runs. My trail markers, they were gone. Torn down, destroyed, or consumed by the blaze. I was well and truly lost, with whatever beast I'd enraged somewhere out there, biding its time in the night. The firestorm raged for hours, turning a swathe of the forest into a charred wasteland. Come dawn, I found myself on a barren, rocky outcrop and did a shaky headcount. I'd lost the trail cams, most of my food rations, and was down to a few precious rounds of ammunition. On any other op, this would have sent me into crisis prep mode. But after the night I'd just endured, there was a grim acceptance. Standard survival protocols didn't matter when the enemy wasn't human. I spent a chilling day nestled in a crag, the distant smoke a constant reminder of the destruction I'd left behind. It gnawed at me, the thought of the locals caught in the crossfire. Were they all right? What if the creature, driven from its usual hunting grounds, turned its rage on them? I used what was left of the daylight to relocate, found a cave in a nearby ridge, defensible, a good vantage point. It seemed untouched, no signs of blood or recent habitation. Yet I couldn't shake the sense of trespass, like I was barging into a predator's den. Night descended, bringing the noises back. Not the brazen attack of before, but a more cautious circling. It knew where I was. I barricaded the cave entrance as best I could, a pathetic shield against the strength I'd witnessed firsthand. My only advantage, this place was tight, limiting its maneuverability. If it came for me here, maybe, just maybe, I wouldn't go down without a fight. The standoff lasted hours. I sat in the darkness, rifle trembling in my sweaty hands, eyes glued to the slivers of moonlight coming through the barricade. Every rustle of dry leaves, every snap of a distant twig, sent my heart thudding. It came not through attack, but subterfuge. A sound directly above my cave, a scraping, like claws against stone. It was on the roof, trying to get in from a different angle. I aimed, fired, and the noise ceased abruptly, 
followed by a heavy thump. Silence stretched on. Had I hit it? Killed it? I didn't dare hope. Something stank outside the cave, a rotting, fetid odor that turned my stomach. First light came, and cautiously, I moved the barricade. The creature lay just outside, sprawled on the rocks. In death, it looked smaller, almost pathetic. Sunlight revealed the extent of the damage I'd inflicted. Several bullet holes peppered its torso. One had pierced an eye socket. But what made my breath hitch was the wound on the underside of its neck. Not a gunshot, but a long, ragged slash, like something else had clawed its way through its throat. I never got my backup team. By the time I made my way down to a ranger station... Half-starved and babbling a lunatic's account, the only evidence I could offer was my mangled radio and the decaying corpse rapidly being dismissed as a bare carcass mangled by coyotes. The official's eyes said it all, wilderness shock, battle fatigue, maybe even a touch of pity. My return to civilization was a nightmare of its own. Classified debriefs, psyche vals, the cold analysis of men in suits who saw a traumatized agent, not the unnatural horror I'd faced. They offered me reassignment, a quiet desk job where no one would question my sanity. I turned it down, told them if they saw monsters in that forest, they could damn well find someone else to fight them. I sold my old condo, bought a used truck, and headed north, far away from the oppressive hush of those Appalachians. Found a tiny cabin for sale in the Alaskan backcountry. It's a different kind of isolation out here, clean and harsh in its vastness. They have bears too, but the mundane kind, the kind you can track and anticipate. Most nights, I sleep soundly, lulled by the wind and the creak of old wood. But some nights... I wake up in a cold sweat, the smell of decay filling my nostrils. My rifle's propped beside the door, just in case. And when the wind whistles through the distant peaks, it sounds a hell of a lot like that same bone-chilling howl that haunts my nightmares. Because the men in suits, they never got the full truth. That thing out in the woods, it wasn't the first of its kind. It wasn't alone. This happened to me a few years back, when I was working construction in Wyoming. It's one of those places people forget about, big sky, empty spaces. We were building a pipeline, miles from the nearest town. My name's Brooks, by the way. City guy, originally. But the pay was good, so I figured I could put up with a little boondocks living for a while. The crew stayed in trailers out by the worksite. Kind of isolated, but we had all the necessities. One night, after a long shift, I was walking back to my trailer when I saw it. Something big, slinking along the edge of the camp. At first, I thought it was a huge dog. Then it stood on its hind legs, silhouetted against the moon. Too tall, too lean, and the head, all wrong. I froze heart pounding in my chest. It sniffed the air, then turned its head to look right at me. Its eyes glowed, yellow in the moonlight. A low growl rumbled from its throat. I turned and ran. Heard the thing charging after me, heavy paws pounding the dirt. I burst into my trailer, slammed the door shut, and deadbolted, hands shaking. Peered out the window, Saw it circling the trailer for a few moments, snarling. Then it vanished back into the night. I barely slept. The next morning, I told the foreman what had happened. He smirked, said I'd been hitting the cheap whiskey too hard. None of the other guys believed me either. Started thinking I might have imagined the whole thing. That changed a few days later. One of the crew, a guy named Flynn didn't show up for work. 
We figured he was hungover. Then his empty trailer was found. It was trash, blood splatter everywhere, and massive claw marks on the walls. No sign of Flynn. Search party went out, cops got called, the whole deal. They never found him. Never figured out what happened, officially. But I knew. And after that, the vibe shifted on the site. People got nervous. The night noises seemed louder, the shadows seemed deeper. A couple of the guys swore they saw something watching the camp, but nobody wanted to admit what it might be. We started working in pairs, never went out alone. Floodlights stayed on all night around the site. I got myself a gun, even though I'd never fired one outside of a video game. The sense of something terrible lurking out there only grew stronger with each passing day. Then, there was the night it came to the fence line. We were huddled in the canteen trailer after work. All of a sudden, the floodlights flickered and went out. The place was plunged into darkness. We heard it then, pacing back and forth along the fence, growling. It sounded massive. Someone tried turning the lights back on. Nothing. Then came a scream from outside, cut abruptly short. Panic broke out. We huddled in the center of the trailer, clutching makeshift weapons. I had my gun, hands trembling. I knew that flimsy trailer wasn't going to stop the creature for long. The snarling just outside the thin wall grew louder, more enraged. We waited, breath held. I don't know how long passed, minutes, hours. Gradually, the noises faded, until there was only silence. We didn't dare move until dawn broke. Creeping outside, we saw the carnage. The fence was ripped apart. More blood, and something else lying nearby. A wolf's carcass, bigger than any wolf I'd ever seen, its throat torn out. That was our breaking point. The foreman called the company, said we weren't safe. They pulled the whole crew off the project. I left Wyoming that same day and never looked back. Some folks might not believe me, might say I made it up. The cops wrote it off as a mountain lion or a bear, even though the evidence didn't match. But ask anyone who worked on that pipeline if they recall what happened and they'll go quiet, get that haunted look in their eyes. We all know what lurks out there in the wilds, things most people write off as myths. After that, I don't look at the woods the same. At night, if I hear a howl that sounds off, a chill goes through me. There was something out there in Wyoming, something old and hungry. And I reckon it's still out there, waiting. This happened to me a few years back, on a trip with my buddies. I'm Tyson, by the way. We always go hiking. Always somewhere new, always off the grid. Keeps things interesting, gets us out of our comfort zones. This time, we decided on the Redwood National Forest in Northern California. Figured it'd be some big trees, easy trails, a good weekend to relax, Little did we know. Setting up camp was easy. It happened in the evening. We picked a clearing near a stream, got the fire going, cracked open some beers. It felt like any other trip. Thomas cooked up the steaks. Carter told one of his dumb wilderness survival stories, the one about the bear and the roll of toilet paper, gets me every time. The usual. We had a good laugh. And then things started to turn, not weird, just different. The quiet felt heavier somehow. The forest gets dark once the sun goes down, but this was more than that. We all noticed it, but nobody said anything. There's always something that makes our city slicker nerves jangle when we're out here. We shrugged it off and kept at our drinks. Then it hit us, the smell. 
rotting meat, heavy and sickening. Even Carter cut his story short with that stench hanging in the air. Then the sounds, low rustling, like something big moving through the bushes, not far. We froze. Nobody was ready to admit they were scared, but you could see it. The rustling grew closer. What is that? Thomas barely whispered, but in that dead quiet, it may as well have been a shout. I flicked on a flashlight on just as something big broke out of the undergrowth, ten yards away. It moved on four legs, but hunched, towering over us. Dense fur, dark, slick with something in the dim light. Too big to be a wolf, not the right build for a bear. Eyes, those eyes, yellow, reflective, trained on us. I swear to God, there was intelligence in that stare. Not like an animal. That's when Mark screamed. The thing charged. Mark stumbled back, tripped over a fallen log. It was on him in an instant, a flash of teeth and claws. Mark thrashed on the ground, yelling. Blood splattered in the flashlight beams. The rest of us scattered. I don't know what hit me harder the sight of Mark being ripped apart, or the sheer wrongness of it. Nothing in the natural world should move like that, should sound like that. A low, guttural growl, laced with something like grim satisfaction. Thomas found his feet, yelled for us to run. No argument there. It was too dark, too dense. I tripped, stumbled, my breath a ragged thing in my throat. All I could hear was the pounding of my own heart, the rasping behind me, and Mark, oh God, Mark. Branches whipped at me, tore into my skin. I didn't care. We just ran. How long? No idea. The adrenaline fueled us. When I finally collapsed behind a huge fallen tree, panting, my whole body trembling, it was quiet again. We were well away from camp. We had run blind. And whatever that thing was, it hadn't followed. Mark? Carter's voice was thick with shock. His face was white, even in the shadows that was when Thomas fell apart. Just started sobbing, heaving these great gasps that tore through the forest. None of us knew what to say or do. Mark was gone. I tasted bile in the back of my throat. This kind of thing didn't happen in real life, not to people like us. Dawn finally broke. We found a trail, made it back to civilization. The rangers called it an animal attack, bear or mountain lion maybe. But none of us believed it. None of us could shake those eyes. I got back home. Took some time off work. Tried to convince myself I was safe, the city streets were safe. But that feeling of being watched, the smell that clings to my memory. I don't think it'll ever leave. We never went back to the forest. The news reports are the worst part. Every few months, another person goes missing up there. A hiker alone, a camper gone off trail. I know what took them. Whatever that thing was, it's still out there. And after what happened to Mark? Months turned into a year, and then another. You try to forget, to bury the memory. Routine becomes your lifeline work, the gym, the same bars. It's a half-life, but it's stable. Then the nightmares start. Not always the attack, though that replays in vivid detail often enough. Sometimes it's just those eyes, glowing in my bedroom darkness. I wake up drenched in sweat, shaking, convinced it's in the room with me. Sleep becomes a battleground. One especially bad night, I cave. I open my laptop and start searching. Old hiker forums, regional news sites, weird conspiracy corners of the internet. Anything related to Redwood National Forest... Missing people, strange sightings, whatever. It's mostly fruitless. Folks disappear in remote places. 
that's part of the wilderness risk. But then I find it, buried deep in a comment thread on a blurry Bigfoot Hunter website. A story eerily similar to mine. A solo hiker, a creature description almost matching, the same gut feeling of unnatural wrongness. And it happened a decade earlier, in the same general area. I'm no fool. This isn't proof of a monster, least not one you'd see on TV. But it's something. Shared experience is a powerful thing, even in a dingy internet wasteland. It stirs a twisted kind of purpose in me. Planning replaces the nightmares. No grand scheme, mind you. It's small, careful. Topographical maps, old news archives for other missing hiker cases in the area. I piece together a loose hunting ground, a range this thing might favor. Gear gets upgraded, sturdy boots, proper trail camera, a hunting rifle I've barely touched since I was a kid. It's all under the guise of needing a new hobby. I don't tell anyone, not even Thomas or Carter. They need to forget, need to heal the way I can't. The first trip back there is a recon mission. Same time of year as when it happened. I stay on the marked trails, but my eyes keep straying into the trees. It feels like being skinned raw, the air heavy with memory. No sign of it, of course. It's not that easy. But the landscape, it clicks with me. I understand now how it could conceal something so large, so quick. I make these outings a grim pilgrimage. Every few months I'm out there. I expand my search area, slowly, methodically. It becomes a gruesome scavenger hunt, each missing person's case another potential breadcrumb. The rifle stays loaded. I tell myself it's for protection, but a darker part of me is itching for a confrontation. Maybe there's no justice to be had, but damn it, I want this thing to know it's not untouchable. The years creep on. I grow better at moving through the woods, at the constant vigilance. I lose that city boy softness. Every crack of a branch makes my heart jump, but it's tempered with a hunter's sharp focus. I start leaving subtle markers where I pass, a broken twig angled a certain way, an oddly stacked stone. A territory game, played against an impossible opponent. Then, on my fifth year back, it happens. Not the dramatic ambush I've spent countless nights rehearsing. It's a flicker of movement in the far tree line. Too tall, too dark for any natural creature. I freeze, rifle raised, but it vanishes back into cover before I get a clean shot. Still, my hands are shaking as I crouch, scanning every shadow. There's a fresh tang in the air, that same rot smell from the attack. It knows I'm here. That changes everything. Blind searching isn't enough. It's too damn smart, too good at hiding. I have to play on its terms. The next trip out, I bring bait. Rancid meat from the butcher, strung up high along a likely route. The trail camera is hidden nearby, a silent witness. It's a desperate gamble. Weeks pass. Then my phone buzzes with an automated alert from the camera. My heart thunders in my chest as I race back up to the forest. The bait is gone. The camera... It's intact, thank God. I'd pull the memory card, fingers fumbling, and drive back to my apartment to load the images. It's there. Several shots. Blurred, nighttime, but unmistakable. The hulking shape, the dense fur, the damn eyes glowing in the flash. It studied the bait, circled. And then there's one last image, clear enough to make my blood boil. It's looking directly at the camera. Not animal instinct, not curiosity. There's a mocking challenge in that stare. The aftermath isn't what you'd expect. No grand confrontation, no final hunt. That image, that knowing look, 
it breaks something in me. The years of anger, of twisted determination, they crumble. I'm faced with the sheer enormity of what I'm up against. This isn't a predator I can outsmart, not one justice can reach. It's simply other. I delete the photos. Burn the memory card. The rifle gets sold. I never hike those woods again. The nightmares don't completely fade, and a sense of something watching lingers in dark corners even within my city apartment. But the obsessive edge is gone, replaced by a bone-deep weariness. I'm a haunted man now, marked by something beyond comprehension. Maybe that's the worst tragedy of all. Happened a few years back when I was working as a biologist at the Fakahatchee Strand. You know, the deepest, wildest part of the Everglades. Name's Rhett. I'm no stranger to the swamp, grew up running gator surveys with my old man in the bayous just south of here. Seen some things that'd make a tourist's hair stand on end, but nothing like this. This particular survey involved tracking invasive pythons. Those things are a blight, wiping out native wildlife at a terrifying rate. We were outfitting one with a radio collar, following the signal in hopes that it'd lead us to a breeding ground. Standard stuff, but Fakahatchee ain't your standard swamp. The air hung heavy that day, buzzing with mosquitoes, the stench of rotting vegetation hanging thick. Sweat poured off us as we slogged through sawgrass, mud sucking at our boots with every step. My partner, Eliza, she was newer to fieldwork, starting to get that wide-eyed look city folks get when they realize they're seriously out of their element. The python's signal led us to a cypress hummock, deeper into the swamp than I'd have liked. Old-growth cypress, trunks massive, their branches draped with resurrection ferns like tangled gray hair. Cypress knees rose from the black water, knobby and gnarled. The place felt heavy, oppressive somehow. It was there we found the body. Not fresh. Waterlogged, partially skeletonized, what was left of the clothes in tatters. Something had dragged it into a tangle of roots. Python, most likely— but this was bigger than the usual meal for even a big constrictor. A knot of unease formed in my gut. It was standard procedure. Report the find. Get the rangers out there. Let them ID the poor soul. But after taking some photos and tagging the location, we kept following the python. That was our first mistake. The signal led us into a maze of root tunnels, the water rising up to our waists. Eliza cursed each time a vine snagged at her pack. I kept trying to shake the feeling that we were being watched, the hair on my neck standing on end. Cypress trees loomed over us, blocking most of the sunlight. Then the signal cut out abruptly. Pythons don't move that fast, especially not after a big meal. I held up a fist, signaling Eliza to stop straining to listen over the buzzing insects and the drip of water. That's when I heard it, a rustle from the undergrowth, something big shifting its weight. A splash echoed behind us, cutting off our retreat. Eliza swore softly, her eyes widening. We were surrounded. I caught a glimpse of the python first. It burst from beneath the roots— body thick as my thigh and longer than two canoes laid end to end. But it wasn't alone. Rising from the water behind it was another creature. At first, I figured it was another snake, some monster gator I didn't recognize. But as it reared up, water streaming off its scaled hide, I realized this thing wasn't natural. It was the size of a bear, but all wrong. The head was long, tapered like a python's, but with massive jaws lined with jagged teeth. Its body was sinuous, covered in scales the color of tarnished copper, 
and its legs were long and spindly, ending in wicked talons. Those eyes, though, a slit pupiled yellow, cold as the water beneath the mangroves. Run! I choked out to Eliza, and the world seemed to dissolve into chaos. Eliza screamed as the python struck, faster than anything its size should be. It coiled around her leg, dragged her off her feet and into the undergrowth even as she fired her pistol wildly into the air. The other creature lunged. I barely managed to throw myself to the side, felt its claws rake my arm. The stink of it hit me then, rotting fish and swamp decay mixed with something I couldn't place. Scrambling backward, I fumbled for my rifle, dropped it in the mud. The thing circled me, its movements unsettling. Not like any reptile, more like some kind of monstrous, overgrown bird. It hissed, the sound like nails on a chalkboard. Eliza's screams went silent, replaced by a wet, crunching sound from deeper in the swamp. I knew then she was gone. Blind panic gave me a burst of energy. I scooped up the python's discarded tracking collar, hurled it toward the creature as a distraction, then bolted. Ran without looking back, instinct driving me on. Tripped, crashed into cypress knees, tore myself on sawgrass, didn't care. The splashing and that rasping has followed at my heels, but slowly started to fade. Then came the gunshot, echoing eerily through the swamp. Must have been a ranger patrol, drawn by the shots. Found my way to them hours later, collapsed, covered in mud and blood that wasn't all my own. They probably figured I got jumped by a gator, lost my partner in the confusion. I didn't bother correcting them. The nightmares are the worst part. Waking up drenched in sweat, the stench of that creature burned into my memory. The way it looked at me, with that chilling intelligence, like I was no more than prey. Every time I close my eyes, I see Eliza's face, twisted in terror, disappearing into the shadows. The rangers never found a trace of her, or any sign of that second creature. Official report blamed a big python, case closed. Me, I quit the swamp surveys. Took a desk job up north, far from the tangle of cypress roots and the dark, still water. Folks hear my story, they either laugh it off or give me that look, the one that says I've spent too long in the sun, gone a little cracked in the head. But I know what I saw. And sometimes, on quiet nights... I feel a prickle at the back of my neck, and swear I smell that rotten stink drifting on the breeze. They say stories about swamp monsters are just old folk tales. But down south, the locals have a name for that thing, something whispered in dark corners of bait shops and whispered around dying campfires. They call it the stilt walker. Maybe it's all hogwash. Maybe it's not. Either way, I ain't setting foot back in the Everglades to find out. It was several years ago, a time I still see in nightmares. We were young, restless. You know how it is when the city walls feel like they're closing in. My name's Ryland, by the way. Me and two buddies, Micah and Jaden, decided a road trip across the southwest was just the ticket. Gas was cheap, we had time, and hell, what could go wrong, right? Turns out, a lot. We ended up on a stretch of barely their highway, cutting through Nevada. Nothing in sight but cracked deserts stretching to the horizon. Old-time radio stations faded. Phones lost signal. It wasn't exactly fear yet, more like the world was narrowing down to just the three of us and the dusty old van we'd rented. Micah was driving, always the steady one. Jaden, shotgun, was scrolling through old photos on his phone, laughing at stupid videos we took that year. Around sundown, 
We spotted a cluster of abandoned structures tucked against a low bluff, old gas station, some sort of roadside tourist trap all faded paint and busted concrete. Jaden yelled that it was the perfect spot for horror movie photos. Micah looked dubious. I was down for an excuse to stretch my legs. The air here had a funny smell to it, kind of sharp, like a struck match left burning. The moment we climbed out of the van, there was this hush. Not just quiet, but like the sound itself had been sucked away. My ears started buzzing to fill the empty space. Micah kept fiddling with the radio, trying to catch a station, muttering that it was busted. The gas station had one of those old signs, the kind with individual letters you could slot in for prices. Most of it was missing, except for one faded phrase, Last C.J. Uh, guys? Not feeling these vibes, Jaden said, his voice way less jokey than usual. My own skin was starting to prickle. Something flickered at the edge of my vision, over by the slumping motel structure. Probably just some desert creature, maybe a bobcat or something. Whatever it was... It vanished a second later. But I caught a glint before it did, eyes reflecting the fading sun, but wrong. Yellow. Burning yellow. Before I could say a word, the world erupted. Micah cried out, a short, ragged yell like he'd been gut-punched. Before we could turn to help him, we heard it, a growl that seemed to tear up from the ground itself. Then a blur of movement— and an explosion of blood. We scattered, pure instinct kicking in. I remember sprinting for the cover of an old car. It was rusty, more holes than metal, but I ducked beneath it. My breath rasped, heart drumming against my ears. There was another of those guttural growls, almost under the car, and I caught a whiff of hot, rotten meat. And dust. It smelled like dust, too, dry and gritty like an old tomb. Then, footsteps? No, clawed feet, scraping over the rocky ground. Whatever it was, it circled the car. I heard Micah scream, a horrible, wet sound cut short with a crunch, a gasp. My mind froze. Panic clawing up my throat, but I choked it down. My dad taught me a long time ago, fear will get you killed. Move slow, move smart. I saw my opening. It passed by the front of the car, and for just one second, I had a clear shot to scramble for the van. I bolted for it, flinging myself inside, hands fumbling for the keys. It saw me, and let loose a shriek. Not animal, no way. The engine snarled to life. Wheels kicked up sand and gravel. I hit the gas, the view bouncing and shaking in the busted rearview mirror. It ran after the van, and even injured, it was fast. It blurred across the landscape, gaining ground. Its form kept shifting, like my eyes couldn't focus on it. A low, loping stride, then upright for a burst of speed, and a flash of ragged fur. Then those eyes, that awful burning yellow. I saw a dip in the road up ahead, slammed on the brakes, wheels kicking up clouds of dust as I swerved off the road. There was a dry creek bed cutting through, almost hidden. The van bounced and jolted down the slope and right through the scrubby growth. I looked back. Nothing. It was gone. I sat there for a long time, shaking, sweating, barely breathing. Eventually, I crept back up to the road. No van, no campsite, no. No evidence of Micah or Jaden. Nothing but that awful silence and the buzzing in my ears. There was a town two mils further on, an old mining settlement clinging to life. The cops didn't believe a word I said. Animal attack, they insisted. Maybe we'd wandered onto tribal land, got caught trespassing. I was too shaky, too out of it. They'd put me in a hospital, stuck tubes in me, 
tried to poke and prod at my mind. They asked about drugs. Nothing made sense to them. Nothing made sense to me. They found the van a day later, flipped and wrecked up near some canyon. Tire tracks in the dirt made no sense. Whatever did that went up a sheer rock face. No other traces of us. News articles called it a mystery. Two guys vanished into thin air. It's been years. Moved to the East Coast now. Can't stand the sight of the desert anymore. I get these dreams. That dry, dead smell. The yellow eyes hunting me. They say maybe a feral man escaped from some institution. The desert crazies that hide out in the scrub. Don't know. Don't really want to. What I do know is this. They sometimes talk about old Native American tales. Creatures living in those desert spaces, skinwalkers. That fits way better than anything else I can reason out. I sighed as I stretched my sore muscles, settling into the old but comfortable cabin. My name is Nolan Birchfield, and I'm a financial consultant who needed escape from the daily grind. This vacation was a necessity. The stress of work was taking its toll on me, and I craved the solace that the dense forest of Oregon could provide. The cabin itself stood for decades. It had a simple layout with only two rooms, a kitchen, and a small living area. The wooden walls were almost too familiar. I hadn't known that what started as comfort would eventually become fear. My experience changed when I met my neighbor, Mildred Keckley, when we both fetched water from a nearby stream. A quick friendship formed as we engaged in small talk about our reasons to escape civilization. I saw disturbing news lately, Mildred admitted one day, glancing around nervously. A woman in town went missing after visiting her family's cabin here. I furrowed my brow, unease gnawing at my insides. That's unsettling. We said our goodbyes and went our separate ways. That evening over dinner, I couldn't stop thinking about the woman's disappearance. Days passed with no news about the missing woman. While chilling on the porch, I struck up conversation with another neighbor, Duncan Whitcomb. He arrived with an armful of firewood for me. Just helping out. He said gruffly but kindly as he placed the pile neatly against my cabin wall. I expressed gratitude and shared what Mildred told me earlier in the week. Duncan's expression darkened. Yeah, heard that too. This wood sure ain't what it used to be. With growing concern for my newly acquired friend's safety and well-being, we began keeping an eye on each other's cabins. One quiet morning following a deep slumber caused by exhaustion from the city life that clung to me, I spotted peculiar prints on the ground outside my cabin. They didn't look like animal prints, but they didn't resemble human footprints either. Worried for Mildred, I decided to check up on her. My fear heightened as no response came from her cabin door after three firm knocks. My gut dropped at the sight of those bizarre tracks leading away from her cabin into the dense forest. Driven by concern and trepidation, I embarked on a search for Mildred at dawn with Duncan. We followed the trail that led deeper into the woods hoping it would lead us to our friend and not a feral beast or disturbed hermit. As we advanced, we discovered what looked like scratch marks on trees and branches cast to the side, evidence of disruption caused by something large. My heart quickened as tension hung in the air like thick fog. We stumbled upon a clearing drenched in dead silence. Everything around us was still, eerily so. At its center lay clothing scraps strewn among unidentifiable viscera scattered across the ground. Oh my God! I whispered, nauseous to my core. It was difficult even to make out what had happened here. A sense of dread welled up inside me, 
a fear that a similar fate awaited any of us who dared step into these woods again. Duncan's face mirrored my own horror. We need to get help. This is beyond anything we've ever seen. The creature's gory handiwork instilled terror in both of us. We knew there was no time to waste. If it struck once, it could, and would, strike again. As we returned with authorities and other armed individuals skilled in tracking dangerous game through deadly wilds, a renewed feeling of vulnerability came over me. I desperately hoped that whatever it was didn't reside in our woods for long, claiming countless lives before it could be hunted down or driven away. We'll manage together, Duncan told me, attempting to assuage my fears. Can't let this thing terrorize us and claim our home. We knew that our strength lay in our unity and determination. Aided and armed with myriad skills from the friends we would make during these harrowing times, we knew deep in our souls that we had a fighting chance. We moved forward with the armed group, each of us feeling a mixture of unease and determination. All of us seemed resolved to confront this monster head-on and protect our community from whatever awaited. John Mercer, our neighbor and a seasoned hunter, joined the group and took charge. He guided us through the woods confidently, checking for any tracks or markings that could give hints about the creature's whereabouts. As we navigated the dense forest, others whispered stories about recent livestock attacks and sightings of strange creatures lurking in nearby woods. The terrified faces of those who lost their homes, crops, and animals fueled our motivation. As night fell, we set up base at an abandoned cabin surrounded by strategically placed traps. A somber air gripped the group as we realized how close we were to our goal to confront the unidentified horror that plagued this quiet region. Late into the night, we heard rustling from a distance. John signaled to us as an enormous silhouette emerged from around a corner. The imposing figure had monstrous proportions, its dark scales glistening under the moonlight as it moved its muscular limbs. It had sharp, Deadly claws on both hands and feet that seemed capable of tearing through anything that crossed its path. This was no ordinary predator but a terrifying force of nature on a destructive mission. Without hesitation, John fired his rifle at it. The shrilling sound echoed in the dark before multiple gunshots followed suit soon after. The creature howled in agony like a wounded animal infuriated by hurtful stings. Just as swiftly as it appeared, it retaliated by charging toward us with unnatural speed. In seconds, it slashed at John blood spurted out like red fountains as the beast tore him apart mercilessly. His screams only fueled its brutal attack. We couldn't stand idly while our friend was brutally murdered. Together, we continued firing our weapons into the beast's scaly hide. Though our shots left visible wounds, the creature barely slowed down. Duncan dragged me away from the scene, realizing our best chance was to escape while others tried to hold their ground. As we tore through the forest, we saw the creature effortlessly taking down our neighbors and friends. No bullet or blade seemed capable of killing it, or even taking away its drive for violence. After hours of running blind through the woods, Duncan and I finally found shelter, a narrow cave illuminated only by our flickering torch. With our back against a cold wall, we listened as dreadful shrieks in the distance grew fainter, replaced by eerie silence. Days later, exhausted, fearful, and hungry, we emerged from our hiding place. We tracked back to the abandoned cabin to check on the other survivors only to find torn bodies and destruction where they had made their last stand against the brute force of pure devastation. We were utterly defeated by this horrific monster. Duncan and I couldn't bear to let their sacrifices be in vain. We needed to warn others about this vile creature. While no one will ever know its true origin or purpose, it has become vital knowledge for our community, 
a relentless predator that could strike at any moment, never showing remorse for those it claims as victims. Despite our losses and near-death experience, ultimately, Duncan and I survived the horrors that terrorized our woods by sheer determination and an unfathomable will to protect one another. We hold on to a hope that mankind will eventually prevail against whatever evil lurks within darkness, perhaps with better preparation and greater weaponry. Until then, we shall never forget those who fell in our battle against this overwhelming force. Our unity gave us strength against an unimaginable foe, an enemy whose presence sent chills down spines, and taught us that when facing unspeakable fear, together we possess a power far greater than one's own. I sat on the porch, taking a deep breath of the crisp air. My name is Roderick Olmsted. I had booked this cabin in the Appalachian Mountains to escape the grind of city life, and my new job as an IT consultant wasn't quite as fulfilling as I had hoped. Little did I know, what I would find here would soon outweigh any corporate stress. My friend Bonaventure Lewiston arrived later that evening, bringing supplies and stories from town. We laughed over our shared adventures and toasted to simpler times. The next day, we stumbled upon a grim scene a small group of hikers were frantically searching for their friend who'd gone missing earlier that day. We decided to help out by forming search parties and combing through the dense woods surrounding the cabin. After hours of searching, Bonaventure and I found ourselves alone in a segment of untouched forest. As the sun began to set, we came across evidence of a struggle. There was blood on nearby trees and leaves trampled on the ground. We realized we had to alert the others, but our cell service was non-existent in this remote area, so we continued searching for any sign of hope. As night fell, uneasy whispers arose among us. Locals spoke of an ancient creature that wandered these mountains— terrorizing those who dared tread on its territory. They described it as a monstrous beast with sharp claws and unique markings on its body. Despite our skepticism regarding such legends, it was hard to shake off an increasing sense of dread as we gathered around our campfire. Hunting rifle at my side, I tried my best to keep watch. What does an IT guy do when he comes face to face with a legendary mountain beast? Bonaventure joked nervously. I guess we're about to find out. I replied with a hesitant chuckle. Hours later, accompanied by silence, we felt a low guttural growl vibrating through the ground, shattering any semblance of safety. Fear overwhelmed us as we stared into the dark forest waiting for an unknown fate to emerge. Suddenly, the creature revealed itself, shrouded by moonlight and towering over us. A massive figure stood before us with elongated limbs and a shredded assortment of furs. Eyes gleaming hungrily, it wasted no time lunging toward one of the hikers. We scrambled in fear, screams filling the air as panic ensued. I grabbed my hunting rifle and fired a shot towards the creature with shaking hands. The sound echoed throughout the night, but the bullet seemed to only anger it further. I fought to catch my breath, watching helplessly as another hiker fell victim to this monstrous predator. Seemingly uninjured by my rifle shot, this beast surmounted our feeble attempts at stopping its onslaught. Bonaventure turned to me eyes filled with determination. Roderick, you need to get out of here. Go back to the cabin and call for help. But what about you? I yelled over the deafening chaos erupting around us. Don't worry about me, he responded sharply. You just focus on getting out of here alive. Without a moment's hesitation, I turned on my heels and sprinted back towards our cabin as fast as my legs would carry me. My mind raced with adrenaline, 
haunted by what seemed like an impossible task, surviving this nightmare and stopping this creature from claiming more victims. As I sprinted through the forest, branches scratched and whipped at me. Tears filled my eyes from the pain, but I couldn't stop. The sounds of the creature's pursuit grew louder, and I knew it was getting closer. In a desperate attempt to survive, I scrambled up a tree and hid among the foliage, praying the creature would pass me by. Minutes felt like hours as I waited in terror while the screams of my fellow hikers pierced the night air. The creature's deep growl reverberated through the forest, chilling me to the bone. My muscles screamed in agony from holding onto the tree branches as tightly as I could. I clenched my teeth and cursed myself for not calling for help before leaving. In my haste to escape, I'd left my phone in the cabin. Now all I could do was hope that someone would come to our rescue or that the creature would lose interest. Suddenly, everything went quiet. The screams had stopped, and even the background noise of nature seemed to have disappeared. Slowly, I allowed myself a small glimmer of hope that perhaps help had arrived or that we had survived the attack. I eased my grip on one hand and parted a few leaves— peering down at the ground below me. My heart raced as images of what that horrifying creature might have done to my friends filled my mind. I held back a sob when I spotted one of my fellow hikers lying motionless on the ground. His face was twisted in horror, and it looked like his limbs had been brutally torn from his body. There were no signs of life. Horrifyingly enough, more gruesome remains were scattered throughout the now moonlit clearing. Panic started to set in as I noticed an unusual lack of sound that seemed unnatural for a forest. Surely, whatever malevolent force was responsible for these scenes must still be nearby. My thoughts were interrupted by an outburst from the creature. It hadn't left, and I knew it was bound to find me. I gripped the branches once more praying my presence would go unnoticed. A searchlight suddenly pierced through the darkness of the forest. I heard shouting in the distance, and my heart rate picked up, an almost deafening sense of relief washed over me. A rescue team must have arrived. The creature hissed and abandoned its search for me, lashing out towards the approaching group. I hesitated debating whether to stay hidden and hope the creature wouldn't look back or make a break for it. As I listened to the sounds of gunfire and struggled to reassure myself that this creature couldn't possibly be invincible, I decided action was needed. Cracking branches underfoot as I dropped down from the tree, I sprinted toward where I had seen my friends lying dead minutes ago. Knowing that there was no time to mourn their loss properly, I raced towards safety. Reaching an area that appeared to be sparsely littered with trampled grasses and broken branches just past our now decimated campsite, it looked like someone had tried to call for help before succumbing to their fatal injuries. An untarnished satellite phone lay next to their barely recognizable form. Pushing aside grief and shock, difficult as it may be required for survival, I grabbed the phone and spoke with frantic haste. Through stuttered breaths of exhaustion and terror, I relayed our dire situation, begging the operator for rescue. The person on the other side of the line reassured me that a team was already nearby. Those gunshots that sent shivers down my spine would ultimately save more lives than just mine tonight. Moments later, Armed reinforcements found me collapsed on the ground from sheer exhaustion. It appeared that dealing with this seemingly unstoppable monster exceeded even their well-honed skill sets contact with our attackers afterward remained unsuccessful despite their concerted efforts. As I later lay in my bed on the outskirts of civilization, that bloodthirsty creature continued to haunt me. Curiosity insistently gnawed at the back of my mind. I needed to know more about this seemingly unstoppable monster. Even though the ordeal was over, 
This unknown predator would continue to haunt me until I could answer these questions. Yet perhaps some things are best left undiscovered. I woke up to the sound of my phone ringing. It was my friend, Jeria Battleston. Hey, you won't believe what I found. Meet me at the old Thompson warehouse in Bloomfield. The sun burned my eyes as I hopped into my car and drove to the location. The warehouse was a well-known spot in town, abandoned for years. Vines crept up its crumbling walls and graffiti stained the outer shell. Upon entering, I found Jeria examining a strange reptilian creature dead on the floor. This creature had flesh that was slimy with colors ranging from deep green to near black. Spikes adorned its spine and its head resembled that of a crocodile, but with larger eyes. With concern, I asked Jeria what happened. Don't know, he shrugged. Stumbled upon it this morning while walking my dog. I noticed deep claw marks around the creature's body. We didn't know whether it was a hoax or if there were more out there. We decided to investigate on our own. Jeria and I have been friends since high school and shared fascination for mysteries. Having uncovered the town's secret bootlegging operation a while back earned us some recognition. We spent days following leads, talking to people who reported unexplained encounters or finding mutilated bodies dumped in secluded areas. As night descended upon town again, we decided to visit Bloomfield Forest, where a few cases seemed concentrated. In the thick foliage and darkness, we relied on our flashlights as we trekked through the forest. Suddenly, we heard faint cries for help branching off from our path. We hurried through brambles until we stumbled across Martha Phelanberg lying helplessly on the ground one of her limbs missing entirely with blood freshly pooling on the soil. Martha was an acquaintance from school, not very well known by others but always courteous when needed. Something attacked. Please help, she whispered, weakly gripping my hand. Attempting to keep calm, I told Jerry to dial 911. As he pressed the button, the connection was dead. Strange. We had signal earlier. Our only choice was to carry Martha back to town and seek help. I told her to hold on tight as I mustered all my strength to carry her through the forest towards town. Suddenly, we heard rustling in the bushes, and a reptilian figure emerged. It was much larger than we saw before, but had that similar grotesque appearance. Its eyes seemed to glow menacingly under our shaky flashlight beams. Backing away slowly, I felt cold sweat forming on my skin as I tried to maintain composure for Martha's sake. The creature started approaching us, its legs silent but strong like a stalking predator. I lowered Martha gently and called out to Jeria. Take her and run. Jeria didn't waste time. He lifted Martha onto his shoulders as they sprinted towards town. The creature now focused on me, and frustration hastily transformed into sheer terror. My body trembling as I stared down this strange reptilian beast in Bloomfield Forest. It lunged towards me with an otherworldly speed while I tried avoiding its claws, slicing towards me with an intent for something much graver than simple intimidation. Time seemed blurred as adrenaline pumped through my veins while evading each new swipe aimed at me by this nightmarish creature from unimaginable nightmares. Injured and exhausted, I saw an opportunity for escape when it missed one attack, giving me just enough time to slip away towards safety or whatever fleeting illusion that gave in this unsettling chase where death seemed always one step behind. But just when I thought there might be some solace waiting for me among the trees, a horrific shriek rang through the air somewhere nearby, tormenting screams echoing like haunting memories that refused to let go. The horrific shriek continued, 
and I knew I had to do something. I couldn't just leave Martha and Jeria to face this nightmare alone. But as much as I wanted to help them, I also realized that my fortitude was dwindling fast. In a moment of clarity, I understood that calling for help was my only option. So, without hesitation, I fumbled in my pocket for my phone and dialed 911. The operator answered almost immediately, but as I began to stammer out the situation, the creature came back into view. Its reptilian scales shimmered with an unnatural iridescence, and its eyes, those unblinking orbs of malice, never left me. I tried to give the operator our location in Bloomfield Forest, any indication that would lead authorities here, but fear choked my voice. Having delivered its shock and awe, the creature resumed its pursuit. It crept closer with each passing second, a fact not lost on the 911 operator, as my breathing became more labored. Wincing through the pain of my injuries, I ran into the darkness again, one step ahead of certain death. All around me were twisted branches reaching out like gnarled claws to seize me in their grasp under the moonlit sky. Then, through heavy panting and thudding heartbeats, I heard the wail of sirens. But would they reach us in time? A sudden blast of shotgun fire interrupted my thoughts. Surprised by this unexpected turn of events, I tripped over a tree root and fell, my face colliding with dirt. My phone now lay in front of me. Its screen splintered with cracks like meandering rivers through glass. The distant voice emanating from it cried out for information, anything that could save us, but by now saying anything might only serve to bring it closer. Redefining what desperation means, I continued limping through the forest in search of my friends, the sirens in the distance offering much needed hope. By some small miracle, police headlights came into view, casting intermittent shadows as they sliced through the trees. Heart pounding in relief, I struggled towards them, tattered clothes now covered in dirt and blood. I met with a pair of officers who looked at me in wide-eyed disbelief before ushering me into the back of a cruiser, one staying behind to face down whatever horror lurked within Bloomfield Forest. Jeria and Martha emerged soon after, breathless but alive. For one blessed moment, time stood still as relief washed over all of us, together now and safe for the time being. Guilt snaked its way into my heart as I realized that it was only luck that had kept us alive tonight. Bloomfield Forest was our home, a place that once evoked laughter and fun times shared between friends but now cast a shadow tainted with dread. The reptilian creature that had hunted us so relentlessly very well could have descended from extraterrestrial visitors or perhaps was an escaped experiment gone awry. All we knew was that it wasn't human, and we couldn't fight it. Huddled together in the cruiser's back seat, I hurriedly shared what little information I had with Jeria and Martha. They listened intently while gazing at their petrified reflections mirrored across shattered phone screens. As we were taken far from Bloomfield Forest, a grim silence settled over us. We could never fully share our story with anyone. They would think we were mad, or worse yet, delusional. But one thing remained certain. Our lives were forever changed by our fateful encounter with that monstrous creature. Now we must live haunted by the knowledge that such horrors exist so close to home, while swearing never again to enter those once safe spaces turned hunting grounds. The scars we bore would stay with us, but the chilling memories etched in our minds welled forth only when the darkest shadows coalesced on cold nights, a stark reminder of what we survived and what still might lurk in Bloomfield Forest. I'm Harold Jenkins, an ordinary guy working as an accountant in downtown Des Moines, Iowa. My day began just like any other. 
I walked a few blocks from my small apartment to the bus stop, waiting for my usual morning ride to work. A friendly neighbor weaved his fingers through the nearby fence, sharing a little inside scoop about the local baseball team's latest endeavor. Upon arriving at the office, I found a peculiar envelope on my desk. Within, a detailed map and seemingly cryptic instructions that led me to a remote location on the outskirts of town. Curiosity piqued, I told myself I'd venture there after work. Twilight set in as I pulled up to what appeared to be an abandoned farmhouse. Hmm, I exclaimed with skepticism as I pulled out the map once again for confirmation. Cautiously making my way inside, the foul odor of dampness and mold filled my nostrils. It didn't seem as though anyone had been here in quite some time. As I rounded a corner, I stumbled upon an old room lined with books from floor to ceiling. Evidently this had once been a library. Scanning the room in search of anything that might explain the cryptic message, something caught my eye a dusty photo album tucked away on a shelf. At first glance, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. There were photos of happy families hugging and laughing, but as I flipped through its pages, gruesome images began to emerge. Crime scene photos mixed among innocent snapshots painted a horrifying narrative no one would expect. My heartbeat quickened as it dawned on me that whoever sent this map wanted me here for some sinister reason. Leaving the library in haste, I continued down the hallway until reaching what must have once been a grand dining room chairs scattered haphazardly and wallpaper peeled from degrading walls. Reluctantly following this trail deeper into the maze of the farmhouse, I found myself in a room with an open trapdoor, its wooden steps descending into darkness. Tensing my muscles and readying for anything, I began my descent, ears straining for any trace of a threat. As I reached the bottom, the dim lighting failed to reveal much beyond a narrow passage stretching in front of me. Pressing forward with each step rendered heavier by anticipation, I quickly realized that the vile smell which plagued the house above was now more pronounced here. I could now hear faint sounds echoing in the distance something between animalistic growls and anguished cries. Unease gripped me as I envisioned what horrific encounters I might have in these depths. Noticing a door slightly ajar, I peered inside, immediately wishing I hadn't. What once must have been a storage room was now converted into a hellish scene reminiscent of scenes from the old photo album. Torture devices cluttered the floor bloodied ropes and a surgical kit gleaming amidst the chaos. Missing person posters plastered across rotting wooden walls filled me with dread, knowing those faces met their grisly ends in this chamber. As horrifying as it all was, Nothing could prepare me for what entered my peripheral vision. Cast from shadows by my flashlight's beam stood a monstrosity like none other, humanoid but undoubtedly feral. Its muscular body towered over me, razor-sharp claws ready to maim and disfigure at any moment, while its piercing eyes bore into my soul. Long snout adorned with rows of impossibly lethal teeth made me shudder down to my very core. Rendered immobile by fear as its gaze locked onto mine, it began to approach, moving with deadly intent yet chilling silence. Despite every alarm sounding within me, flight wasn't an option. So paralyzed was I by its unnatural presence that had so abruptly infiltrated our reality. My phone buzzed at that very moment, the sound echoing in the enclosed space against the walls. What might have been mistaken for a predator closing and sent my heart into overdrive. The creature inched closer, and my instincts screamed for me to move. As it stepped into the light, my phone buzzed again. The creature paused and cocked its head toward me, its breath harsh and grating through its menacing snarl. My heart pounded against my chest, threatening to break through. Unable to bear the agonizing silence any longer, I fumbled in my pocket and pulled out my phone. In a panic, 
I thumbed through my contacts list to find Jake, praying he would answer. Jake, I whispered hastily when he answered. I need your help right now. There's some thing. It's going to kill me. What? Where are you? He inquired urgently. In that old building behind the gas station. I replied as quietly as possible. Please hurry. The line went dead. My pulse raced, and sweat beaded on my forehead. The creature took slow, calculated steps toward me. The fetid stench of decay filled the room as it advanced. I could feel its eyes boring into me, leaving no doubt of its malicious intent. The floor creaked behind the creature as another figure entered the room. A person armed with a shotgun stepped from the shadowy corridor adjacent to where the frightful wolf-like being loomed over me. Get away from him! Jake shouted with terrifying ferocity, leveling his weapon at the fiend. Without hesitation, he fired. The blast echoed painfully in my ears as a look of pure shock crossed the creature's face. Whether due to injury or surprise it was impossible to tell but it staggered back before regaining its footing and lunging at Jake with incredible speed and ferocity. Jake frantically attempted to reload the shotgun even as he tried to dodge the attack. He was far too slow to avoid those gnashing teeth completely, screaming in pain as they tore into his shoulder after his abrupt dodge. My newfound mobility that stemmed from the assistance of my while-injured friend still allowed me to bolt past the monster as Jake dished his own desperate gambit against it. Panting heavily, scared for both our lives, I fled from the torturous room into the dark hallway as fast as my shaking legs could carry me. Emerging into an open area, I noticed a door left ajar at the far end of the corridor. As I sprinted towards it, determination and fear combined an adrenaline course through me in equal measure. The momentary glimmer of hope struck as I grasped the metal handle pulled that fateful door open. With a deafening crash behind me, I knew it was not long before the grotesque being would come searching for its prey once more. In a desperate bid for my life, I turned and slammed the exit door shut behind me, then staggered onto the street outside the building, my battered body struggling to hold back collapse. Sirens pierced through the night air just moments later. Flashing blue and red lights painted shadows around us like a morbid waltz. Police officers swarmed around me asking questions about what had happened. Their inquiries blended together as pure white noise amidst my shaken state of mind. Jake soon emerged from the building, injured but alive, officers attempting to depose him of his weapon, all reports stating it misfired when he fell after tripping within that dark corridor, from medical treatment to his self-induced wounds. The look in his eyes unmistakable, relief that we were both alive despite what we encountered within that hellish place. In time... We did manage to piece together what had happened or at least tried to rationalize it with our limited knowledge of horror stories in mind. The creature was something perhaps none could understand, its existence beyond, its heinous murderous desires comprehensible only by madmen or movie monsters. The night we faced the beast marked an event seared into our memories, a monstrous foe that transcended our understanding of reality. The scars it left on both of us will never fade. Despite lacking any explanation for our encounter, one thing was unquestionable. We had survived against the odds, and we hoped never to come across that terrifying creature ever again. The morning sun had just crept over the horizon, igniting the sky in a chorus of orange and crimson as I made my way up the narrow dirt path that led to my watchtower. I'd always enjoyed the solitude of working as a fire lookout in the expansive Coconino National Forest, nestled within Arizona's rugged landscape. The scent of pine hung heavily in the air, 
a comforting reminder of nature's persistent embrace. My name is Eamon Fitzgerald, and each year as summer unfurls its dry heat upon the land, I take residence in this wooden sentinel to guard against nature's potential fury. Weeks can pass without human contact up here, offering plenty of time to ruminate over an estranged relationship with my brother, Cormac, who I hadn't spoken to since our falling out some five years ago. On one particularly sweltering afternoon, while scanning the endless greenery for any sign of smoke or aberrance, I noticed something odd, a series of irregular markings trailing off into a secluded enclave that maps didn't acknowledge. Perhaps carved by poachers or some vagrant making their hidden home in these woods. I radioed it in reluctantly. Curiosity gnawed at me more than duty. This is Watchtower 7 reporting something unusual on the southeast ridge. Static hissed back at me before a terse acknowledgement from dispatch encouraged me to investigate further if conditions were safe. Equipped with my hiking boots and an uneasy hunch, I ventured down from my airy. The air grew heavy as I neared the site. The ground was littered with what looked like clumps of fur contrasting against patches of scorched earth. It wasn't until the wind shifted direction that I caught it, the unmistakable stench of decay. Something got caught in a brush fire. I murmured to myself, rationalizing what could have happened. Disturbingly, though, amidst this carnage were scattered belongings, tattered remnants of camping gear, and amongst them lay an unnervingly pristine notepad filled with entries describing an increasingly frantic encounter with some unruly wanderer. The entries ceased mid-sentence with a jagged line angling off the page as if drawn mid-tremor. Realizing I'd stumbled upon a campsite's violent and rather than natural phenomena, a chill crept up my arms despite the lingering heat. Animals don't leave journals, I thought. Overcome with unease and draped in silence so stark it felt predatory itself, I noticed movement beyond the shade line, a figure cloaked not by shadows but by sheer incongruity with its surroundings. Adrenaline surged through me as this entity, a man cloaked in furs matted with earth and blood, moved toward me with startling intentionality. There was nothing otherworldly about him. He was simply another denizen consumed by isolation or madness. That notion alone was terrifying enough. Our gaze locked for what felt like eternity until instinctively I darted towards my tower of isolation where safety lay in heights and observation. Branches cracked underfoot while his laughter, a genuine human sound mingling madness and clarity, followed me between gasps for air and rallying cries to legs begging for reprieve. Reaching for my radio, words failed to form when his garbled hymn sang into it first. How high can you climb before home is a distant memory? My thoughts spiraled into disarray. Funny how crisis injects humor into horror, but no laughter came from me. The distance lessened between us as our deadly dance neared its peak without showmanship or audience to bear witness, only two souls abandoned by society on collision course. I kept running, hoping my high vantage would offer a reprieve. My breath came in sharp bursts. The tower stood as my only refuge, its structure a stark contrast to the chaos below. This man— his features masked in filth and unwashed grime, represented a threat of untold violence. I reached the ladder, climbed with haste that echoed in the rhythm of my pulse. Boots on each rung, I ascended. Up high in my metal and wood haven, I finally dared a glance downward. He circled like a predator beneath me. His gaze followed each of my movements, with hunger writ large across his unwashed face. Without radio contact, cut off from the world by circumstance and remote location, I had no means to call for help. The lone tool that connected me to civilization crackled with his haunting melody, a reminder of its futility. Hours passed. He did not wane in his vigil. 
I surveyed the campground from my perch, seeking any sign of previous life or passage. None but ravaged tents and that journal with its jagged lines remained, mute heralds of a story I would never learn. As night descended, his form grew less distinct until merged fully with the darkness at the tower's base. Sleep was an adversary I could not conquer while besieged by another more tangible. Dawn brought no solace. His presence was an unrelenting pressure at the edge of perception. Whether through instinct or madness-driven patience, he persisted as if time held no meaning for him. On the third day, he finally retreated back into the wilderness from which he emerged. What remained was a campsite littered with items from lives interrupted and one survivor who couldn't begin to comprehend the events that had unfolded. The forest reclaimed its silence, as oppressive and empty as before. The only testament to what occurred was left in disjointed entries across scattered pages and memory alone. It wasn't until authorities arrived days later that I learned of others who went missing, hikers, explorers caught unaware like myself, but my pursuer had vanished without a trace into the densest thickets and shadows of an unforgiving wild. When asked what happened here, all I could manage to say was that something lived out there, what it was exactly, even now, remains beyond my grasp. But those terrifying days stand etched within me, conflict not of flesh but of wills against an unknown entity whose motives were as clear as they were inscrutable. In the end, survival was about waiting for whatever hunted you to grow bored. It was about being patient, more patient than your predator. My actions during those tense hours were not heroic, just human, and perhaps that is why I could walk away when others did not. It happened several years ago, a time in my life that has definitely shaped me for who I am today. Back then, I was an avid outdoorsman, always the first in my crew ready to embark on some backcountry adventure. I'm Marcus, by the way, and at the time, this story I'm about to tell unfolded, I was in my early twenties, full of boundless optimism that only the youthfully naive possess. My best friend, Jasper, and I had this thing back in college. Every season we'd head out into the wilderness for what we like to call our quarterly excursions, just fancy talk for multi-day hikes into some remote area. On this occasion, we chose a chunk of untamed land within the Olympic National Park, a lush expanse of rainforest hugging the wild coastline of the Pacific Northwest. Getting deep into that area is not simple. You have to cross rivers, slog your way through old-growth forests, and then battle that dense undergrowth of ferns and devil's club that seems to swallow up everything in its path, all while carrying a substantial chunk of your life on your back to boot. That was exactly what we had signed up for to escape any trace of humanity for a few sweet days of nothing but the sound of rain and the rustle of the wind in the towering canopies. The park ranger who issued our permits gave us a stern warning to watch for signs of wildlife, not the standard bears and cougars there had been scattered reports of unusual activity out in this isolated section of the park. It sounded vaguely ominous, but hey, adventure's what we did— and besides, rangers always err on the side of caution. We thanked him, got in Jasper's beat-up truck, and drove as far as the access road would take us before beginning our descent into the wilds. Day one felt like a dream. Our destination was one of those remote beaches you get only on this stretch of coastline, dramatic cliffs dropping into the pounding surf, mist hanging low around them with patches of light breaking through the whole nine yards. We made decent time through the trees, catching glimpses of the sea every now and then. Reaching the wide expanse of beach in the late afternoon, it was more magnificent than I'd even imagined. 
We set up camp and got cracking on a fire pit with some driftwood before nightfall. Then on the morning of day two, that's when things took a turn. Not anything immediately sinister, mind you. More like an odd series of small and yet unnerving incidents. I woke up first. The beach lay veiled in a dense fog, a damp stillness clung to the air. No rustling of birds or small critter chatter like the morning before. I called out to Jasper but got no reply. Figuring he wandered off down the beach, I went to stoke up the fire and get breakfast going. That's when I noticed it. Footprints. Big ones. Bigger than human feet. My sleep-fogged mind tried to rationalize them. It must be that ranger and his buddies doing their rounds. But hadn't he said these parts were isolated? No, wouldn't make sense for them to be all the way out here. Some other hiker then? Perhaps. But with my outdoors experience, I found myself studying the way the prints sunk into the damp sand, their unnatural depth and odd stride. An undeniable, creeping tension gripped me. They didn't seem right. Hey, man, check this out. Jasper broke into my anxious internal commentary. My head jerked up. He'd reappeared just at the tree line with a bundle of broken branches and other debris in his hands. He noticed the look on my face. Whoa, rough sleep or something? Instead of answering, I gestured toward the footprints. Jasper dropped the wood with an unceremonious clatter, followed by a long silence. It wasn't an awkward silence of shared confusion. It was something heavier. Finally, in a strained voice, he said, Think it's connected to the reports? That question was our unspoken fear now given voice. We wasted no time dismantling camp. Our usual relaxed pace transformed into frantic efficiency. It felt like something watched us. Not animalistic, but conscious and calculating. Our earlier enthusiasm dissolved into a primal unease. This has got to be some other hiker messing with us, Jasper suggested, though his tone did little to reassure either of us. Our trek back didn't involve leisurely moments spent admiring the giant slugs or gnarled old trees. Every snap of a twig... Every unexpected rustle in the foliage triggered a surge of adrenaline. Our senses were in overdrive. Jasper swore he heard noises that didn't quite fit the soundscape. Low, guttural grunts he insisted were no wildlife he'd ever encountered. We didn't talk about it, but knew in the pit of our stomachs he was right. Nightfall caught us before we were within range of the access road. With no choice but to set up another night, this one filled with restless, fitful sleep, I started losing grip on my rationality. Then day three began, and that's when the hunt officially started. The fog remained. Visibility was down to a miserable fifty feet at best. It was hard to shake the feeling we were being herded towards some unseen destination. We stumbled down a deer trail pushing our way through thickets that seemed to grow denser with every passing hour. Jasper kept pointing out broken branches, strange scratches high on tree trunks, the occasional twisted sapling bent completely over, signs of the presence of something that was both powerful and unsettlingly large. Then we saw it. A flash of movement through the foliage, hulking and dark. Just a glimpse— and then it was gone. An electric crackle went up my spine. Whatever this was, it was impossibly huge and unnervingly stealthy. Jasper and I locked eyes. No words passed between us. Turning and sprinting seemed like the only rational plan. We crashed through the dense undergrowth, adrenaline pumping like rocket fuel through our veins. Behind us, we heard the rhythmic crashes of pursuit, followed by guttural grunts and snapping branches. My breath itched every time I imagined a massive clawed hand bursting through the greenery to snatch one of us. 
a horrible scene echoing one of those cheesy 80s horror flicks we ironically would mock after a couple of beers. The relentless pursuit continued. Our lungs burned, limbs ached, yet we had to go on. Suddenly, we broke out of the thickets onto an old logging road. Relief surged through me, mixed with stark terror. In the clear space, whatever was chasing us would have a straight shot. That realization didn't stop our feet. We kept pumping our legs, desperate to make distance. And then, from up ahead, the glint of Jasper's old truck came into view. I don't even recall the mad dash towards the vehicle. Fumbling with shaking hands on the door handle, flinging our heavy packs inside, the roar of the engine, and the squeal of wheels clawing at the gravel. Finally safe, right? My body slumped against the worn seat back, trying to regain control of my ragged breath. We locked the doors and just sat there in silence for a moment. Neither of us wanted to look back. It felt like we were tempting fate. Finally, Jasper managed a choked. All right. Now what? The answer was, we did the only thing we could, got out of that place as fast as humanly possible. That primal drive for survival kept us locked in silent determination for the ride back. All the usual joy of exploring was gone, replaced by a visceral need to simply escape. It wasn't until we hit the open highway that some ragged form of conversation surfaced. The usual, did you see that? Kind of exchanges and shared nervous laughter filled with both horror and disbelief, as if trying to talk about it would dilute the terror into something vaguely manageable. It was then we made another chilling discovery. Rummaging for snacks, we found Jasper's phone at the bottom of his backpack. The cracked screen and dents hinted at the frantic rush at some point during our frantic sprint through the forest. He flicked it on, more in defiance of our ordeal than with any real hope. Surprisingly, it blinked to life. Then we saw it a notification icon with several missed calls from an unknown number. In the car's eerie green instrument lights, a wave of nausea washed over me. That park ranger from days ago those vague warnings about unusual activity. He must have picked up our abandoned gear at camp and saw those footprints at the beach. We never reported back in. This was, well, an attempt at rescue that was too little, too late. I glanced at Jasper and found my own expression of dread mirrored in his drawn face. This thing would always remain on the edges of our consciousness— a lurking threat from the dark corners of the wilderness. We drove straight to the nearest ranger station once we made it to the first signs of civilization, barely taking time to explain before getting back on the road and fleeing that area as fast as we could. That beast, as far as I know, remains out there, the hunter of the rain-soaked Olympic rainforests. People call them Bigfoot, Sasquatch, but frankly— Whatever you call it, there are shadows in the untouched spaces of this world far older and stranger than most people care to consider. It happened a couple of years ago, during one of those late summer drives through the Midwest. Not the fun kind either. My aunt in Ohio had passed, and there I was, stuck in rush hour outside of Des Moines on my way to that small-town funeral nobody ever wants to attend. Joel's my name, by the way. Not exactly adventurous, I know. More of a settle-for-a-desk job and watch Netflix kind of guy than a wilderness explorer. Maybe that's what made me do it. After hours of cornfields and billboards— Something in me revolted. Iowa looked about as flat as a map. Now, where the highway swooped up to cross the Raccoon River, there was a brown sign for a state park, Makokata Caves. Caves? It piqued my interest. Sure, bats and cramped spaces aren't my deal, 
but it beat another four hours on the interstate. The park surprised me. Woods instead of prairies, winding trails, rock formations peeking through the trees. There were signs explaining how glaciers carved the whole place, the caves, the cliffs, the natural water slide-looking formations. All neat if you're the sort to geek out over geology. For me, it was just peaceful after staring at taillights. That, and the place was nearly empty. It being that time of day, close to evening, that seemed wise. Not the best idea to wander off into caves right before closing time. My plan was simple. Hike the main trail, take some pictures for the folks back home, prove I wasn't slacking at a rest stop, and find my way back to the car. What actually happened? Let's just say there's a reason these parks put up maps at every junction. It's easier than you think to get turned around in the woods. One minute you think you're on the loop back, the next, trees you've never seen before close in, and the path starts to climb into thicker forest. By the time I realized I was properly lost, twilight was filtering through the leaves. Great. No flashlight, not exactly prepared, remember? And with that thick canopy overhead, darkness would likely fall fast. It's then that survival instincts that my couch potato life failed to develop should have kicked in. Instead, panic did. You gotta know, those true crime documentaries aren't great for the nerves. They play in your head. Every rustle in the underbrush morphs into a predator. Every snap twig is some maniac sharpening a knife. I scrambled uphill, following this faint, overgrown track. Logic shouted in the back of my head that running in the woods like a headless chicken in fading light was about the worst plan imaginable. But logic was pretty much drowned out by my heart pounding in my ears. Finally, the slope leveled off. My chest burned, sweat dripped off my nose, but that surge of adrenaline subsided like a deflating tire. Ahead was a clearing, rough ground, more rocks than dirt. Not what I had hoped for, but at least a vantage point. At the clearing's edge, there was a drop-off. It took in the valley below, dense woods all the way to the horizon. There was a stillness at the world's edge, something old and vast that made me shiver. Maybe it was the isolation setting in. No familiar noise cars, horns, the buzz of a city just a low thrum of insects, and the lonely whistle of wind through branches. Then there was a new sound, heavy, dragging footfalls from just beneath the ledge. The first instinct was to flatten myself on the ground and pray. Then, curiosity, or some sort of terminal idiocy, got the better of me. I crawled to the edge. That's when I saw it. Below, standing awkwardly but upright on two powerful legs, was a massive figure. Harry. Its dark silhouette cut across the final streak of sun breaking through the trees, and all I could make out was its bulk, hunched shoulders, long arms ending in heavy-looking hands. I must have made a noise, though I can't recall what. That hunched shape swiveled on its heels. Yellow eyes flickered up at me, glinting in the gloom. They seemed intelligent, which somehow was far scarier than a wild animal stare. I choked out a gasp and recoiled. Then, with an agility that seemed incongruous for its size, it was scrambling up the rocky face towards me. Frantic, I pushed backward. My hands found nothing but loose stones. It was going to grab me, drag me down. There would be no trace, no body found. I'd become some missing person statistic, whispered campfire story about the dumb city slicker who wandered off the trail. Just when those big hands were clawing over the rim, I stumbled backwards into something solid. Pain exploded through my shoulder. I fell sprawling as something metallic, a gun barrel, jabbed my cheek. Whoa, hold on there. A man's voice cracked above me. 
Then the creature let out a roar. Part animal, part human, raw fury vibrating through it. I scrambled and half crawled away as the man swore. There was the boom of a gun, echoing off the cliff, and a terrible howl. Then a crash of underbrush, receding fast. Suddenly the forest echoed with silence. Are you hurt? I blinked up at my savior, sprawled in the dust with a look of dawning horror on my face. The man stood above me, gun held awkwardly, and I think it was at that moment that the shock really hit me. He was older, not in great shape, with his thick graying beard and sweat soaking through his faded camouflage gear. I stammered something, trying to sound grateful and not completely out of my mind. He gestured vaguely, as if indicating the way I had fled. Seen anything odd in these woods, did you? That question snapped me back into focus. What was I meant to say? That a Bigfoot wannabe tried to make me into his dinner? He didn't seem to expect an answer. Instead, he nodded a few times, as if confirming a suspicion. All right, then. I'd better follow them tracks. With that, he was gone, plunging back into the trees from where I'd sprinted moments before. That snapped me out of my fog. He was chasing after it. I stood yelling for him to stop, but by that time, he was swallowed up by the twilight woods. Scrambling back down to the trail was easier in the gathering darkness than climbing up had been. My heart drummed as fast as before, but now it was mixed with a sick realization. There's plenty of weird folks out there, sure, but the gun, the quick shot, whoever that man was, he hunted things a lot bigger than deer. I never found my way back up that slope, and there was no sign of anything amiss down on the main trails. At the funeral, relatives asked about my detour. I gave some non-answer about finding a pretty overlook didn't want to be that city cousin with a wild story. Sometimes, in a city apartment lit by traffic lights instead of stars, I see that figure lurking under my bed, in dark corners, its yellow eyes reflecting in a car's headlights. Maybe I got lucky that day. Or maybe this is the first act of a horror story with an ending none of us want to be part of. A couple years back, just before Thanksgiving, I decided to finally visit Yellowstone. Been reading about it for years, watching those nature shows, all those geysers and animals. Everyone I spoke to, well, they couldn't stop talking about it. I figured that since the crowds were likely thinning with the colder weather, now was the time. Work had been brutal, and a nice little solo trip with just me and the wilderness sounded perfect. Hell, maybe I'd even treat myself to one of those rustic little cabins just at the edge of the park. I rented a pickup truck from the airport in Billings, a rugged thing meant for Montana roads. I remember laughing to myself and wondering if some big city type like me could actually handle something like that. Turns out, it wasn't hard, and there's something about the roar of a beastly engine that's downright addicting. I got on the highway and pointed the nose of that beautiful piece of machinery toward the park. Made excellent time. Even hit a little diner right along the highway one of those places with sticky checkered tablecloths and pies just like Grandma used to make. My name's Mark, by the way. Nice to meet you. Yellowstone's a sprawling monster of a park. It took me quite a while just to get from the entrance near Gardiner to the cluster of visitor centers around Old Faithful. It didn't matter. Being out there, the wide open roads, those mountains cutting a crisp line against the cold November sky, felt incredible. The first couple of days I played the tourist, walking the geothermal boardwalks with steam coiling in my face, the smell of sulfur burning at my nostrils, 
snapping selfies like every other idiot. My goal, though, was to see the park without all the other people. Get into the back country, find some peace. My fourth day in, that's exactly what I did. Packed up some basic essentials, food, water, warm clothes, the usual backpacking fare, and ventured out on a well-marked trail. I started near one of the geyser basins, figuring the steamy haze and otherworldly atmosphere would make for a memorable start. My plan was to loop around, maybe do some off-trail hiking towards the wilder terrain near the park's border. That's how I always like to do it, find a little corner of the woods that doesn't look like it sees human footprints too often. Now, you gotta understand that as someone who spends most of his life staring at spreadsheets, those first few hours in the woods were pure bliss. I'd barely touched my phone, even turned it off completely for a while. It was perfect. I took my time, breathed in the clean air, stopped to stare at tracks in the mud, wondered what creature had made them. It felt amazing. Like, truly amazing. The silence, the stillness. It was everything a guy trapped in a cubicle could wish for. There were some other humans on the trail at first, but their voices fell away into the forest's whisper. That's when things started to feel off. Maybe it was just nerves. Spending too much time alone can do that to a person. It's almost like a sixth sense you haven't used in a while begins to wake up. I was on edge, twitching every time a branch snapped behind me. I swore I saw movement a couple of times out of the corner of my eye, but when I glanced back, there was nothing. Still, that uneasy feeling only got stronger. It was the middle of the afternoon by this point, but the shadows cast by those gigantic old-growth trees grew thicker, like they were deliberately hiding something. Every few minutes I'd hear a sound, a sort of crackle in the underbrush, or the rustle of unseen leaves. Every single time, the noise came from a different direction. This wasn't the wind, I was certain of it. My instincts were screaming at me. Something's out there. Something you wouldn't like. I tried to push the paranoia aside, chalk it up to the quiet. Then came the smell. I stopped dead in my tracks. It was faint, a sort of musky scent, like that of a wet animal. But there was something else to it, an undertone of rot, like meat left in the sun for too long. Something wasn't right. I reached for my pack, fumbling for the bear spray I'd bought on a whim at the gift shop. Not because I genuinely thought I'd need it, more as a last line of defense. I'm far too practical for the whole, better safe than sorry, mentality. But with those shadows dancing over the path, and the stench thick in the air, I wasn't laughing anymore. Something was out there with me, following me. That feeling solidified with every rustle of unseen leaves. I'm not a religious man, but a prayer might have escaped my lips even so. Now, this part might sound silly to you. Heck, the park rangers told me as much later. That's their job, I suppose. The voice. That was another thing that tipped everything from just being creepy to outright nightmare fuel. It started quietly, a faint muttering behind the trees, just outside my peripheral vision. Not human, that much was for sure. The rhythm was wrong and there was a raspy hiss at the edges of each word. I wanted to run. My limbs begged me to flee. But that damn curiosity and fear itself had rooted me to the spot. I had to know what was behind the voice. The rational part of me knew whatever it was would likely tear me to pieces, and yet a strange fascination settled over me. A tree to my left shuddered, its branches rustling, its leaves parting. For a brief moment, my eyes caught sight of something. It's difficult to explain in words, I realize. Think of a patchwork, one put together by a mad person. 
There were glimpses of a bony frame, covered in taut, mottled gray skin. A flash of a snout, too long to be natural, yellowing fangs jetting out like daggers. Eyes those horrible eyes yellow slits of light burning within their sockets. My stomach lurched. I vomited into the undergrowth. And with that, what little restraint I had left vanished. It turned away, and I turned too, not back toward where I came from, but in the direction that this creature led, and I ran. Ran hard, blindly stumbling over twisted roots. The muttering sound intensified behind me, the voice almost guttural in its rage. Thorns and bramble lashed at my legs, drawing blood. The stench filled my nostrils, thick, putrid, and suffocating. The path wasn't a path anymore. It was just a desperate struggle to put space between myself and whatever that thing in the trees was. I tripped, and the world slammed into my face dirt, leaves, pain. Then I was scrambling again, clawing my way uphill, fueled by adrenaline and fear. A cliff ledge jetted suddenly before me, and I skidded to a stop, heart pounding in my chest. It was only as I stared down into the vastness of the ravine below that I realized there was nowhere left to run. My eyes stung with tears. It was over. I turned around, expecting to see the yellow eyes blazing through the trees, ready to end me. Nothing. There was nothing. I stood there, panting, waiting, yet all was silent. I slowly crept back from the edge, my knees buckling with relief. Then I heard it, the crackle of dry leaves from within the trees below the cliff. It slithered past my line of sight, disappearing into the underbrush. It had toyed with me. That realization almost broke me. It took me hours to muster the courage to get out of there. That thing that damn monster could reappear at any moment. Eventually, the setting sun and the knowledge that night in the wild was some creature lurking was even worse helped me find my feet. Back on the trail, I ran without pause, not stopping until the twinkling lights of a roadside and flickered into view. People at the end looked at me like I was crazy. Dirt clung to my torn clothes, blood streaked my face from the fall and thorn scratches. And the story, well, who the hell would believe a story like that? Rangers found my footprints later. They asked about the trail conditions, what the wildlife was like, routine stuff. They never caught whatever that thing was. They likely didn't believe me. A few weeks later, a couple went missing along a stretch of that same trail. Never found them. When those poor souls' story made the news, those memories clawed their way back, the stench, the rustling of leaves, those inhuman eyes, a piece of me knew. Some things live out there, hidden in the deepest, darkest corners of wild places. Whatever I encountered then, they call it a skinwalker. You might call it an occupational hazard, the kind that comes with the territory when you're knee-deep in secrets as murky as the swamp surrounding our facility. Nestled deep in a wooded area of Mississippi, Pine Creek Genetic Lab was a place known to a select few and spoken of by even fewer. That's where I, Harlan Quayley, spent my days enveloped in classified government work dabbling with things that would make the average person's skin crawl. My team and I, Devin Cooley and Maritza Eldridge, were brilliantly unorthodox, not your typical badge and gunnery types, but more akin to unconventional scientists with more than a touch of field training. If these trees could talk, Maritza once joked after an accidental drop of liquid nitrogen. They'd probably scream for miles a grim sentiment on a regular workday. Yet none of U.S. could expect how close to truth her words would land. We arrived at the brink of dawn. It was our mantra, B-1, 
beat the sunrise, harnessed its vitality. The trees guarded us like timeless sentinels as we entered the complex. Today's schedule was supposed to be examining the results from our latest CRISPR trials on cephalopod DNA. What we found instead was chaos incarnate, containment units compromised and glass shattered in splatters of fluorescent ooze, a grotesquerie come alive. The stench was enough to make bow rise in one's throat. Davin quipped about wishing he'd skipped breakfast as he reloaded his tranquilizer gun. Humor was his shield against fear. Mine was skepticism until I faced what lay beyond logical comprehension. Something had escaped, not through cunning or trickery but through sheer brutality ripping merits from our reinforced safety measures like they were nothing but paper. Maritza vocalized then what none of us dared think. No creature of science or man-made horror made these marks, a thought cut short by a scrape that made our nerves jump. Tracking footprints led us deeper into the maze-like underbrush. Gashes in bark and soil spoke volumes of an escape route carved with primal ferocity. The air felt heavier with each step we took, charged with unknown possibilities. Regrettably split from my colleagues during pursuit, I stumbled into a clearing straight out of natural lawlessness, evidence of carnage disfiguring what once must have been a deer, now reduced to savage artwork from which crimson still flowed, staining ferns into ominous bookmarks. A guttural snarl shattered silence explosively, an unseen dread lurking just out of sight among twisted vines and looming pines. I should have called for help then, but prideful foolishness glued my hand away from reaching for the walkie-talkie, instead gripping my firearm tighter. Alone, adrenaline became both fuel and enemy. All senses peaked for survival when instinct screamed every evolutionarily honed warning. That's when it appeared, not in full form but partial glimpses of tenebrous silhouette brushing past thicket and thorn. A monstrous elegance blended perfectly within its woodland maze. Muscle memory commanded raising my weapon against a shape shifting too rapidly for human eyes. Distorted as it moved amidst shadows made tangible by setting sun rays sifting through leaves overhead. Then came brazenness born out of desperation. The trigger pulled repeatedly punctuated by each bullet finding only air or trunk instead of flesh. Its roar, a symphony composed by no feral predator known or named, followed at my heels cueing disease-like unease under my skin just before realization struck hard. No government project gone awry could wield such mastery over nature. Fleeing seemed the only option. The creature swiped at the air where I had been moments before. Its claws scraped bark, sending a flurry of birds screaming into the dying light. Thick fur, matted with sap and leaves, coated its heaving sides. Massive, it stood on hind legs that bent in unusual ways. I broke through the underbrush, my lungs ached. The walkie-talkie, that was my mistake. My thoughts raced to it, now somewhere behind me along with my dropped firearm. That lifeline to the outside world had seemed an unnecessary weight against my own experience in these woods until now. I kept running. The distance between myself and that thing had to keep growing. It bellowed anger or perhaps frustration, and trees shuddered in its wake. Moments or eternities passed until I saw light not the soft glow of sunset, but artificial, harsh and welcoming. The ranger station emerged like a fortress in the wilderness. Inside, Dave looked up from his report, his face questioning my state. It's out there, I panted, slamming the door and twisting the lock shut. What? Slow down, Dave demanded even as he moved towards the gun cabinet. No time, was all I could say before another roar shook the small building. I should have called for help when I had the chance, I realized then. But fear made logic a distant dream. My silence put Dave at risk too. The creature rammed against the door, 
testing our refuge with brutal force. Dave handed me a rifle with steady hands despite his pale face. Minutes passed like this a brace for entry, irrelentless in its assault. It was Dave who moved first towards the radio as would splintered behind us, an SOS bursting forth while we held our breaths. Help arrived in sirens and shouts. The creature retreated into the forest steps just as backups swarmed the area with lights too bright for any animal's liking. Injuries were reported later to rangers caught off guard by something unstoppable and wild on their approach to us. One would retire early due to his wounds while another would never speak of what he saw again. We questioned local wildlife experts shared our story about its size and intelligence but found nothing conclusive. Discussions turned reluctant as reality set back and around us I would never walk these trails alone again or sleep soundly through howls carried by wine through tree branches. In time, talk faded into logs and files about unexplained encounters and local whispers of a shadow that hunts among pines. Whispers I ignore now when walking by daylight amidst calls of safe passage, knowing there are darker truths left untold beneath canopies where sunlight fears to tread. 